They had been told that they would soon be taken to paradise. Chosen by the great masters of the universe, these disciples were ready to fly off to a distant planet. What their leaders had forgotten to tell them was that this cosmic trip was going to cost them their lives. These unfortunate gullible souls were unable to tell the difference between cosmic visionaries and imposters. In October 1994, the horrific incidents involving the Order of the Solar Temple, which took place in both Switzerland and Quebec, put the spotlight on the hidden world of cults, which were created during what is now referred to as the Contactee Movement. In 1952, an American immigrant of Polish descent gave a whole new meaning to UFO sightings. Before a room full of press agents eager for a sensational story, George Adamski said that he had telepathically received a message telling him to go to the Mojave Desert where he saw a spaceship. Adamski claimed that he was in contact with the pilot of the craft who said he came from Venus and was here to warn humans of the dangers of nuclear weapons. Adamski's story was hailed by UFO groups as proof that UFOs were of extraterrestrial origin. The following year, Adamski co-authored Flying Saucers Have Landed, which became a huge success and marked the beginning of the contactee movement. In the months following the publication of this book, several individuals claimed that they had also been contacted by extraterrestrials from Venus or Mars. Well before that, at the turn of the century, researchers at the Lowell Observatory had noted features on Mars that seemed to indicate the possibility of seasonal patterns. And according to Schiaparelli and Percival Lowell, these features might be channels made by intelligent beings. In the 1950s, astronomers were already aware of the properties of the planets in our solar system, like Mars and Venus. It was known that Mars had a very thin atmosphere. Venus's atmosphere was very thick and hot. Still, researchers had a fairly good idea of the patterns on those planets. If we look back, there was that famous radio program by Orson Welles that shocked the world in the 1930s, just when World War II was starting. Radio listeners thought that Earth was being invaded by Martians. I think that society's fascination with the possibility of alien visits was stoked by events such as that. Astrophysicists and photography experts proved scientifically that Adamski's claims had to be false. From then on, UFO groups distanced themselves from the contactee movement. Ignored by the UFO community, and often ridiculed by the media, the contactee movement developed on the fringes. Nowadays, there are hundreds of these semi-religious groups who believe that we are in contact with extraterrestrials. Head of religious studies at Laval University in Quebec City, Alain Bouchard takes a keen interest in these new religious beliefs. If we look at the number of groups generated by the contactee movement, we're talking about several hundred. But they're mostly small groups with just a few members each. We would need field researchers to find them all. In most cases, the group only lasts as long as its founder is alive, or until the novelty of a revelation dies down. One of the first mysticism-based UFO groups to crop up in the United States was the Unarius Academy of Science. UNARIA stands for Universal Articulate Interdimensional Understanding of Sight. My name is Dr. Charles Spiegel. I'm the present director of the UNARIUS Academy of Science. UNARIUS is a nonprofit, tax exempt, educational, and scientific foundation. 
33 spaceships that will land, will land right here on this land. In fact, I can point right up here where this sign is, it says, Welcome Space Brothers. Despite the fact that its two founders had left their mortal remains on Earth, and extraterrestrials had failed to show up at the appointed contact times, Unarius continues to flourish with more than 6,000 members. Ruth and Ernest Norman founded Unarius in 1954, claiming that aliens had asked them to free humanity of its karma. Since, according to Unarius philosophy, current humanity is nothing more than the product of a series of reincarnations. Ruth Norman claimed that she was the reincarnation of Socrates, Mary Magdalene, and Mona Lisa. The future of the Earth world is positive, progressive. We promise you. While it's true that most groups created by the contactee movement were trendy and harmless, the horrors of the Solar Temple led to increased vigilance by state and civil authorities. Mathieu Cossu maintains a French internet site designed to protect people from the dangers of cults. People like to talk about UFOs and extraterrestrials. There's a certain mystery to them. In the US, a lot of subjects were raised by contactee groups. For example, a while back, there was a guru who used to talk about universal energy, a master Dang, that was his name. He supposedly received instructions from higher beings who came to see him while he was traveling on an airplane. There was also Isozen, a sect whose guru received messages. To attract new members into their flocks, they needed a gimmick, one that would seduce people in different ways. For instance, a sect might attract new members by claiming to have the answers to questions that we all wonder about. Who are we? Where are we headed? What will become of us? Claiming that extraterrestrials are coming makes the group more mysterious and attracts people to that group. The more mysterious the discussions, the better. And when discussions focus on extraterrestrials, the members of the group feel privileged. I'm part of something special, and extraterrestrials are communicating with me. Extraterrestrials appear to have the same qualities as God. They know everything and can do almost anything. Technologically speaking, they're 25,000 years ahead of us, according to the Raelians. So an extraterrestrial is like a god. From one group to the next, these New Age religions seem to have the same basic format. If they're not expressly alien in origin, then the founders are prophets chosen to pass on a message from a cosmic visionary. You've always dreamed of studying under Jesus, Buddha, or Muhammad? Well, it's too late for them, but it's not too late to study with me. In general, the message always goes along the same line. There are both good and bad extraterrestrials. The evil ones want to destroy humanity, while the good ones want to save it. The disciples in the cult are the elected ones, who are under the protection of the good extraterrestrials. There is no typical profile, but we've noticed that each group has a family atmosphere, if you will. How can we typify people who join these cults? Choosing a religious minority sets them apart from the rest of society. They generally have a lot of drive, so it's odd that they're usually portrayed as sheep. Research has shown that these people want to distinguish themselves from others. Joining a cult is an act of defiance, since the person will be noticed and perhaps ridiculed. So, one of the main characteristics of these people is that they wish to stand out in a religious sense. There are also people who question life. I would say that best describes the people who join these groups. They identify themselves with their group. Probably the main thing that they have in common is a desire to distinguish themselves from others.
I don't think that anyone here on Earth is 100% safe from the powerful influence of a sect. The 1970s and the New Age movement breathed new life into these UFO-based cults. Several leaders stole ideas from Eric von Daniken and Robert Charoux, who had come up with the theory of ancient astronauts. Contactees' visions changed with the times. Pilot uniforms were replaced by long white robes, and extraterrestrials, who had previously appeared in the flesh, now appeared as ethereal beings living on higher spiritual planes. Cosmic messengers no longer needed their spaceships. They could now communicate with humans telepathically. In the midst of this shift in perception, a young man from France, Claude Varillon, publicly announced that he had been contacted by extraterrestrials on December 13, 1973. It seems that Claude Varillon, who had previously gone by the name of Claude Seller when he was a pop singer, was now being encouraged by his cosmic visionaries to change his name to Rael, signifying light bearer. First, he tried his hand at a singing career, imitating Jacques Brel. Raelians sing of honey and cinnamon, but that song was originally called Sacré Sale Gueule, and when he sang it, he looked like Brel's clone. After that, he tried his luck as a sports reporter, since he loved automobile racing. He started a small magazine called Autopop. But when the energy crisis hit in the 1970s, his magazine went down, since auto racing had stopped due to energy restrictions. Then he appeared on a French television program called Le Grand Échiquier. He explained that one day, while walking in the Auvergne Volcano Park, he met up with some beings who said that they were Alhems. They were about four feet tall and had contacted him to pass on a message. In 1973, I was a reporter for an auto racing magazine in France. As I was walking through the Auvergne Volcano Park, I saw a bright spaceship land near me. A small being came out of the craft and gave me a message, which you can read in this book, True Face of God. It's available in all bookstores in Quebec. This message explains that in the beginning, when there was no life on Earth, these extraterrestrials came and created life on Earth. Okay. From then on, people began to contact him after they saw him on television. That's when the movement started. As far as we know, in the beginning, Claude Vaurillon was not an authority figure, someone who takes himself too seriously. He was just a guy with a message to deliver, right? Then gradually, as I see it, he began to get off track. The attention went to his head. The approach changed from a laid-back atmosphere where no one was really in charge, there was no authority figure. This was back in the 1970s, when there was a sexual liberation movement happening and everyone was talking peace and love, to an approach that's entirely different today. If you compare the Claude Vaurillon that people knew back in the 1970s, with the beloved prophet, as he is known today, dressed in his cosmonaut outfit that smells like mothballs, it's amazing to see how he has changed. I think that as he went along, Claude Vaurillon became a typical example of someone who was guru-fied. He became richer and richer. How much do we know about the truth of his original story? We do know that it contains a lot of contradictions. For example, we checked the weather conditions on the day that he supposedly met these beings, and it doesn't match what he said. There was a program on the M6 network in which a childhood friend of Claude Vaurillon's was interviewed. And this friend said that during the course of a meal together, Vaurillon had told him something like, in any event, I made up the whole thing. You already knew that, it's not news to you. According to Roland Chevalier, Vaurillon came up with this tale, people believed him, and he was suddenly in the limelight with more social status than ever before. If you look at the description of Claude Vaurillon given by Jacques Chancel, he was an ordinary middle-class guy who wore glasses. Then if you look at Claude Vaurillon in the 1970s, he appears more lively and liberated.
Everything Claude Vorion says, his main theme is based on the theory of ancient astronauts. If you look at the cover of the first books published by Rael, you can't help but notice how they resemble books published by Robert Laffont, with a black background and yellow print. If you read Claude Vorion's books, you soon realize that they're full of plagiarisms. And his story about the Elohims? That's a plural Hebrew word, which for some people means extraterrestrials. That explanation comes from an author named Jean Sandy, who wrote a book called The Moon Outpost of the Gods. What's interesting is that if you bring up these facts to the Raelians, they will simply tell you that other people had insights before he did, and that doesn't make him any less important. But as you dig deeper, you find plagiarism upon plagiarism. The shape of the flying saucer, for instance, obviously came directly from Adamski. The only difference was that Adamski described it and Claude Vaurion drew it. The similarities go on and on. He even used the symbol of the Star of David with a swastika in the center, which he stole from Adamski as well. It was mentioned in Adamski's book Inside Spaceships. Everything that Claude Vaurion says has already been said by someone else before him. He simply puts a different spin on it and simplifies it. When you are familiar with other authors, it's more like bad science fiction than anything else. It's plagiarism pure and simple. And when I say he copied other people, I mean dates too. Not only did he steal the image of the flying saucer from Adamski, he also stole the date that the incident happened, December 13th. Unlike France, where a climate of intolerance close to that of a witch hunt has been felt since the Solar Temple tragedy. We must resist the temptation to compare all cults or religious minority groups to extremists like the Solar Temple or Heaven's Gate. In actuality, very few of these groups are a real danger to their followers. The Raelian movement founded by Claude Vaurion may seem troubling since it is on the fringes of society, but it is still nothing more than a cult. People seem to have started thinking that the Raelian movement is another religion, a sect that believes in God. No. I recall that my original messages were misconstrued by the tabloids. We're anything but a sect. We don't believe in God. We believe in extraterrestrials who are beings like you and I, but much more technologically advanced than we are, creating a sort of cultural shock at the technological level. It's a bit like the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy, where an empty Coke bottle lands on the ground and the Bushman thinks to himself, the gods must have sent this. There are no gods, and there's no such thing as a soul. That being said, how can we possibly be qualified as a sect? I don't understand. I wish to repeat that our religion, as you call it, is not religion at all. It's science. The secularization of religion has led to a drop in spirituality within society. It's as if science was taking the place of religion. Religion is becoming more secularized, while science is becoming more spiritual. Science leads to technological advances. That was one of the traits of the 1950s, a movement towards idealizing technology. Even today we're fixated with technology. Just look at computers. If I want to be socially accepted, I need a laptop computer and a cell phone. It's almost as if we identify ourselves with our technology. We live in a society where technology is all around us. The same thing happened to religion as well. What we need to understand is that thanks to technology and science, the world we live in in 20 years from now won't look anything like it does now. I'm telling you, it'll be totally different. People think that evolution is progressing at a constant rate, and it will take us centuries to advance. That's just not true. Why? Because of computers. That's what I explain in this book. Computers become almost twice as powerful each year. To sum it up, we've discovered more things in the past 20 years than we have in the entire history of the human race. In the next 10 years, we'll do the same thing. Then in five years, then in two years, then in less than a year, then in six months, then in three months, if we add up all those time frames, we arrive at 2020, 2025. By the time we get to that period, we'll be discovering more within one week than we did in the history of the human race. Then, in a day. Eventually, we will get to the point where transhumans, as I like to call them, will be able to discover major principles within the space of a minute. By 2020, 2025, we'll know everything.
Extraterrestrials are the gods who created us, just like the Bible says that God created us. We have taken the biblical model and changed the word God to extraterrestrials. And we have replaced all of the acts of God with technological know-how, laser beams, clones produced in the lab, and so forth. Cloning is a tool mentioned in the message from the Elohims. At first, our followers were a bit hesitant to talk about the connection between the Bible and extraterrestrials, but when it comes to science, young people get very excited. There's a big difference between the old academic scientists who are against anything new, which is normal since they're old and tired, uh, the, the dinosaurs of science, and today's youth, who flock to us by the thousands, full of enthusiasm. We stated our mission from the outset 27 years ago. We're in favor of technological advances. That's why I wrote this book, Yes to Human Cloning. We're not just in favor of cloning, we're also in favor of genetic engineering. We're in favor of genetically altering plants. If you give me a choice between two boxes of strawberries, one of which is grown normally and the other genetically altered, I would immediately pick the box that was genetically altered. They contain far less pesticides, and even though they have modified genes, the digestive system can still break them down. They pose no threat to the human body. So-called normal plants are huge polluters. They are the reason why pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides are sprayed into nature. With genetically altered products, we are actually protecting the environment. Condemning anything that is new and modern is considered to be politically correct, but it's a false promotion of green products. We support anything that is new, without exception. Play games, that are worth playing. Go ahead and play. Change your sources of pleasure. Find something new to excite you. Come and play in the game of life where we can play together. 20 years from now, there'll be thousands of cloned children in perfect health. Just watch. 20 years from now, even if I'm not around anymore, you'll meet with my successors. And everyone will say, I can't believe how they criticized Riel back then. Once the news was out that they had cloned Dolly the sheep, Rael was quick to announce that he was setting up the first company to clone humans. A few years later, I don't know whether or not you read his book, Yes to Human Cloning, but in it he explains that he made that statement for the publicity. Basically, in the beginning, Clonade was just a publicity stunt. I call that an empty shell. All those years that it was nothing more than an empty shell, he would tell people that they were doing something. They were going to clone a human. It would be soon, within a year. Then he announced that he was building a lab and they were working on the clone. The owner of the lab, Mark Hunt, who wished to remain anonymous since he was an American lawyer and politician, wanted to clone his child, who had died at an early age. He had asked the Raelians to do one thing, to verify whether his child's DNA could be used to create a clone. They couldn't even do that much, he said in the Charleston Gazette. It cost them the equivalent of $250,000. We're now asking parents to pay $200,000 to have their child cloned. After all, we're not talking about the price of a condom here. As I told you earlier, Roland Chevalier publicly admitted that Rael had confessed to inventing everything. His daughter discovered the same thing. She got upset at her father, and as a result, she was excluded from the Raelian movement, excommunicated, as it were, and her cellular plan was cancelled. Your cellular plan is what allows you to be cloned on the Elohim's planet. The Raelians don't believe that we have a soul. Without a cellular plan, you can't come back to life. You're dead forever. So here, his own daughter was excluded from the Raelian movement, and her cellular plan was cancelled. Why? What I heard from ex-members is that she went around saying that her father was making up lies. Her name is Aurore Vorillon. Other than the family problems caused by his speeches, Royel has been free to spread his teachings throughout Quebec. Perceived as amusing by the majority of the population, Royalian theories are for the most part harmless, according to experts. 
si on prend l'ensemble des groupes, on si on prend l'ensemble des groupes, on voit que les changements émergents reflètent des changements dans notre société, surtout dans le domaine de la religion. Euh, donc, le mouvement raélien est un bon reflet. Le raélien mouvement reflète des changements qui ont été en place en Europe et en nord America, euh, particulièrement dans le contexte Especially with regards to the Catholic Church. Euh, donc, pour moi, la, la question des nouvelles religions, des innovations religieuses... Je pense que ces nouvelles religions, 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 religions et le raélien mouvement en particulier, euh, sont symptomatiques de ces changements dans change notre notre société. La résultante... Quelles sont les principales caractéristiques de notre société Freedom and democracy. I think that the creation of these groups is actually a very positive sign. It means that we live in a society where we allow the creation of new concepts, even if they may at times seem bizarre. Taken from this angle, I don't think that we should see a danger in them. They're a sign that democracy is working. What worries me is when a group puts someone up on a pedestal and that person starts losing sight of reality. From their pedestal, the person may start believing that anything is possible. They could say pretty much anything they wanted to and people would believe them. I've read some of his material and I thought to myself, this can't be possible. He goes on and on. It's like a joke. He's just rambling on. He's got to be aware that he's just spouting nonsense. It's as if he's testing his followers, pushing them to their limits. The problem is that they don't seem to have a limit. As time goes on, it just gets worse. What do I see as the danger when someone is that high up, always on a pedestal? They lose their sense of perspective. They can even end up believing all of the nonsense that they originally made up. We saw that happen with the Church of Scientology and its leader, Ron Hubbard, who upon his death had come to believe all of the tales he had told his followers. That's the danger. On October 6, 1994, a story hit the newspapers and television networks. An unexpected and horrific event had just taken place in Morin Heights, Quebec. Police found the remains of two bodies in a burnt house, apparent victims of suicide. A few hours later, it was announced that three more bodies had been found. All of the victims had been members of a sect, the Order of the Solar Temple. And it seemed that some of the victims had not committed suicide. They had been killed in cold blood. While the population of Quebec was still reeling over this tragedy, another news story broke out even wilder that struck horror in the hearts of Europeans. In Chery and Grand Chaux-Servin, police officers had just found the bodies of 48 victims also members of the Order of the Solar Temple, in the smoking remnants of two burnt homes. In total, there were 53 deaths, including several children. Journalists and police officers in Quebec and Switzerland sought a reason why the members of this sect would have done such a thing, and they discovered the disturbing teachings of the Solar Temple. The names of the two main leaders were released to the public. Joe Dimambro, the high priest of the temple, and Luc Jouret, a man who used his charisma to attract new members. Francois Bourbeau, the director of UFO Alert Quebec, remembers the first time that he met Luc Jouret. When did I meet Luc Jouret? It was in 1985, during his first visit to Quebec. He gave me a brief interview about 20 minutes long. I saw him again in the fall of 1989 when I introduced him at a three-hour-long conference in Quebec City. That was when I saw the real Luc Jouret. His hair was longer and he was a bit of a playboy. He looked at the women a lot and he changed his story somewhat. He didn't talk about extraterrestrials in public. He spoke about them with me later in private. But I learned that there was a dark side to his story. A few of my colleagues who were working on a story for the magazine Alter Ego discovered that Luc Jouret had a project underway with a large investment corporation in Toronto, Clarkson Gordon to be exact, an accounting firm. 
To build a hotel in Shawinigan worth 13 million with a circular runway for flying saucers to land on. An investigation by Quebec police officers revealed that several employees of Hydro-Quebec were gravitating towards the order of the Solar Temple. One of the tabloids soon inferred that the provincial government had been infiltrated by members of the Solar Temple. Inspector Jacques Saint-Pierre was closely involved in the investigation of the matter. He has a somewhat different interpretation. What happened is that Luc Jouret gave several conferences. He had an incredible amount of charisma. Some companies invited him to come and speak to their employees, and one of them was Hydro-Québec. He had such a charismatic aura about him that some people were drawn to what he had to say. Some people believe in religion, while others have lost faith. They no longer have any lifetime dreams or goals. They've achieved everything that they hope to achieve, and now they're looking for something new to latch onto, to feel alive again. That's what happened in some cases. Certain people may have found something interesting in what Luc Jura had to say and decided to join his cause. At first, the order of the Solar Temple based itself on beliefs and rites harking back to the days of Templars and medieval knights, creating rituals that involved not only famous symbols such as Excalibur, but also more modern religious items. When asked about the ceremonies that took place within the sanctuary of the temple, some members confided to investigators that they had seen several strange phenomena, such as the appearance of cosmic masters. Some of these visions, or should I say illusions, were likely created using classic techniques practiced by magicians, or perhaps a sophisticated holographic projector. During the investigation, I also learned that Mr. Dutois, one of the victims in Moran Heights, had been a self-educated man. He would have been capable of producing a machine to project holograms. The reason why Mr. Dutois died is because he knew everything that was going on. He couldn't stick around here on Earth. He had to be killed. In addition to the medieval rituals symbolizing knighthood, the order of the Solar Temple gradually began to integrate an extraterrestrial element. When the time came, temple members would have the exclusive privilege of being transported across the galaxy to the planet Sirius, where a better life awaited them. The fact that they were expecting the world to come to an end did not make them dangerous. Christianity has existed for 2,000 years and is based on that belief. We have no criteria for determining how dangerous a group is becoming. As is often the case, right up until a week before the tragic events, we had no idea that anything was going wrong. All we know is that it builds slowly, like internal combustion, and it only takes a minor shift within for panic to strike, and then boom. Joe de Mambro's days were numbered. When we investigated, we discovered that he had been very sick. He was not expected to live long. Since he didn't have anyone to replace him, to take charge of the solar temple once he was gone, the days of the order itself were numbered as well. That was probably what drove Joe de Mambro to decide that the time had come for the trip to Sirius. There was no one to carry on the temple. Even if we can try to understand what was going through Joe de Mambro's mind when he announced that it was time for the trip to Sirius, it's even harder for us to understand why he wasn't content to just take volunteers with him why he chose to murder certain members of the Solar Temple. Several members were murdered, and I can explain why. In the teachings of the Solar Temple, there was one element that was fundamental. Eventually, 
they would be transported to Sirius. But members of the Order of the Solar Temple would not have committed suicide. Suicide was forbidden within the temple. The only way to be transported to Sirius was by fire. Among the victims, there were people who actually believed the teachings. But as you know, there is a big difference between believing something and acting on it. So some members believed in the teachings, believed that they would someday find themselves on their way to Sirius, but not necessarily when Joe de Mambro decided they would. Numerology was important to them and played a key role in their teachings. So they needed a precise number of victims. Since the number of members willing to make the trip with Joe de Mambro was lower than the predetermined number, they decided that they needed to kill enough members to make up the difference. If you were to ask me what the leaders of the Solar Temple said to their members, what they hoped to gain, I think the answer is quite simple. They wanted the same thing as every guru in charge of every sect, money and power. Barely four years after the Solar Temple horror, another cosmic visionary made the headlines. This time in California, Marshall Herf Applewhite. In 1972, after receiving a series of treatments at a psychiatric hospital in Houston, Applewhite and one of his nurses, Bonnie Lou Nettles, began a spiritual odyssey based on their alleged contact with extraterrestrials. Dubbed the two, Applewhite and Nettles used the Bible to attract followers to their flock, specifically the book of Revelation, chapter 11, verse 3. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days. Naturally, the two witnesses spoken of in the Holy Scriptures were none other than our two cosmic gurus, Applewhite and Nettles, who began to go by the names Bo and Peep. Through telepathic contact with friendly extraterrestrials, the gurus learned that evil extraterrestrials were preparing to destroy the human race. Their cosmic visionaries instructed them to identify a group of chosen ones to be removed from Earth and placed in safety. In the spring of 1997, UFO researchers noticed a strange light at the tail end of comet hale bopp Marshall Applewhite, who had changed the name of the group to Heaven's Gate when Nettles died in 1985, said that he was certain this light was the famous spaceship coming to take the disciples away, despite formal contradictions by professional astronomers. Heaven's Gate was a much more self-contained group. If there was any interaction with the outside world, it would have been through the Internet since several members had websites. But overall, they operated as a small group and kept to themselves, which led to the incidents that took place in California. After having videotaped farewell messages to their friends and family, the 21 women and 18 men in Heaven's Gate took a deadly drink containing alcohol laced with a drug. There's just no way of describing how great it's been how much we're looking forward to what's ahead for us now. Do I think that the Raelians are a UFO-based movement like, say, Heaven's Gate was a UFO-based movement that ended in the tragedy that we all know, the collective suicide of 35 people? My first reaction is to say, no, I don't think so. But I would like to add that there are things going on within the Raelian movement that aren't exactly kosher. We are in favor of eugenics. Geniocracy means rule by geniuses. It's an elitist view. And added to this elitism is the idea of genetic purity, which must be absolute. If you are genetically impure, the Elohims, the creators, don't want you around. Tiny robots so small that you could fit billions of them into a drop of water. Just imagine if Rael were to have a successor 
that took all of this stuff seriously. The tragedies that took place within the Order of the Solar Temple and Heaven's Gate make us wonder if perhaps legislators and the police should take more drastic measures to prevent any further carnage. Can we predict when things will get out of control within a sect to the point of suicide? That's a difficult question to answer. If it were predictable, then the police would be able to step in and prevent it from happening. I live in a democratic society, and as I always say, as long as I respect the freedom of others, I guarantee my own freedom. When we talk about groups that are similar to the order of the Solar Temple, we need to get one thing straight. The Quebec Provincial Police carry out an investigation whenever a crime is committed. But if no crime is committed, the police have no reason to investigate. They don't go around investigating things just for the fun of it. A crime must have been committed. Obviously, there are other groups that resemble the Solar Temple. But until a crime is committed, the Quebec Police Force does not get involved. Personally, I prefer to live in a tolerant society rather than one which believes in witch hunts like France. It's unfortunate that people think there is a witch hunt going on in our society. As a volunteer of an association, my own personal goal is not to pursue a witch hunt. It's more a matter of prevention and precaution. I feel that people are wrong in thinking that we are conducting a witch hunt. French legislators have no wish to instate a witch hunt of any kind. France is a democratic country, a secular state. It's important to separate spiritual matters from worldly matters. Separating spiritual matters from worldly matters. For individuals questioning their existence, isn't it more satisfying to the ego to know that you are a member of a chosen few? Isn't it somehow gratifying to rub elbows with visionaries who are the reincarnation of Socrates, Mona Lisa, or even Jesus himself? And when these cosmic gurus invite us to join them on an intergalactic journey to a far-off paradise, how can we turn down such an inviting offer? How can we tell the difference between spiritual matters and worldly matters? How can we unmask the imposter disguised as a cosmic visionary? Now that we are in the 21st century, contacts with extraterrestrials are far from subsiding. They are being used more and more often by gurus. This brings to mind a quote by Viktor Stokowski, who wrote a major paper on visitors from other worlds called Men, Gods, and Extraterrestrials. We may not like the world as it is, we may find reality to be confusing, boring, and at times cruel, but it is dangerous to dwell in the absolute certainty that beyond this reality lies a mystical paradise, a better life that we can achieve by sacrificing our life in the here and now. If a group is led by someone who is so terrific, so personable, so humane that you find yourself thinking, why haven't I heard of this person before? And when the goal of the group is so fantastic that you find yourself thinking, this is too good to be true, well, then it probably is too good to be true. Always use discernment. Russian writer Alexander Pushkin once said, the illusion which exalts us is dearer to us than 10,000 truths. If Pushkin had lived in the 20th century, he would have had a heyday browsing through UFO literature. In this strange world, where faith is often more important than knowledge, swindlers abound. The world is full of tricksters of the imagination.
Since the early 1950s, a rumor has persisted in UFO circles that one or more flying saucers crashed in one of the largest American deserts in Arizona, New Mexico, or Utah. And what's more, according to witness reports, not only did the American army recover remnants of this craft, they also captured some of its occupants. Despite the Army's silence, the mystery has lingered year after year. Should we or shouldn't we believe that aliens were captured? That is the question. The rumor grew as a result of information from various sources, such as Timothy Good, author of Beyond Top Secret. In Beyond Top Secret, I published the story of a Polish biophysicist who, together with a team of French, British and Italian scientists was taken to a vault in the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where three levels below the floor level, they were shown materials, part of a skull and a hip bone of an alien creature recovered in New Mexico in 1947. They weren't given any further details, but subsequently this Polish biophysicist, whose information I, I use, comes up with some detailed scientific information about uh, what he learned about these creatures. However, despite Timothy Good's opinion, these unverifiable accounts do not constitute valuable proof in the eyes of non-believers. If they can't see and touch an alien, skeptics need more convincing proof than mere empty words. In the midst of ongoing debates between believers and skeptics, something spectacular happened. In the early 1990s, Raymond Santilli, a London-based film distributor, released an archived film that hit the world like a bombshell in both UFO circles and the general public. In the uh, sort of early 1990s, a film came to light, um, brought to the public by a chap called Bray Santilli, who effectively said that he had purchased canisters of film from someone in America who had shot them back in, in the 40s, and that what effectively they revealed was the autopsy of a captured alien at Roswell or at some similar sort of event, and, uh, and you see the eyelids being removed and you see bits of the body being looked at and so on. And, Either, I mean, there is, it has the merit of one thing. Either that is a genuine alien autopsy or it's a fake. There's no argument that this could be some kind of mistake, that it's something else or whatever else. It's either one or the other. As John Spencer said, the film Alien Autopsy fired up debates within the UFO community regarding authenticity of proof. Since verbal accounts of UFO sightings did not seem to be convincing enough proof, some believers decided to hark back to the old adage, a picture is worth a thousand words. Starting in the 1950s, a series of amazing photos began to appear in the press. A photo that was supposed to depict an alien char to the controls of a spacecraft was dubbed Tomato Man because of the perfectly round shape of the head. Upon closer examination of the picture, a pair of eyeglasses could be seen near the burnt body, proving that it was nothing more than a human pilot. In 1982, American UFO researcher Leonard Stringfield published Crash Retrievals Status Report 3, a document that dealt exclusively with alleged UFO crashes. On page 47 of the document, Readers can see a picture of what is supposed to be an alien hand found by American agents in southern Florida. The famous photo appeared in several UFO magazines before falling into the hands of a photo professional in Massachusetts. Mark Pelliquin had been a medical photographer with Harvard University's Department of Neurobiology for eight years. When I saw this picture of the alien hand, uh, <laughs> It struck me first as a very poor quality photograph. I saw right from the top that it was most likely a, a, a very poor copy, maybe first generation of a um, museum catalog photograph based on what I saw for the lighting and the density of it. Curiously enough, um, it was about that, that time too when I saw an exhibit at the Peabody 
museum at uh, at Harvard on um, showpieces from uh, P. T. Barnum, and in there was uh, uh, an artifact that he touted around uh, called the Mermaid. Uh, it was, had some obscure origin in the Philippines or something like that, but it was essentially, it was like a fish body with a monkey skull and these hands glued onto it. And the hands looked exactly like the alien hand. Harvard was kind enough to uh, provide me with a photograph, which I sent to uh, authorities who, uh, the UFO authorities whom I very much respect. And, uh, <laughs> and the alien hand became no longer the alien hand. In the fall of 1990, newspapers published a photograph of what they claimed to be one of the aliens retrieved in Roswell, stating that the picture had been found in the archives of the deceased Dr. Felix Zigo, an obscure Russian UFO specialist. A few months later, a second photograph appeared on the same subject, but much clearer than the first, raising wild speculation in UFO circles. Was it a leak within the Air Force, or a hoax orchestrated by information agencies? Although the origin of the first photo could not be confirmed, the origin of the second one could. In an article published in The Orbiter, American UFO researcher Jim Malesiuk said that he had obtained the photo from Canadian journalist Christian Page. The humanoid in the pictures was nothing more than a wax and latex figure on display in the early 1980s at the Strange, Strange World Pavilion, one of the few buildings still remaining from the 1967 Man and His World exhibition. In February 1990, a few years before Raymond Santilli distributed his alien autopsy film, which had allegedly been taped by the US Air Force the day after a flying saucer crashed in the Roswell Desert, American and Canadian UFO researchers began to receive a series of strange documents in the mail. The anonymous author claimed that on November 4th, 1989, a flying object of unknown origin had been forced to make an emergency landing in the swamp outside of the small town of Carp, Ontario. Once on the ground, the UFO, still intact, was fired upon by three helicopters sent to the scene by Canadian and U.S. Secret Services, who were working together on this matter. Next, using the nerve gas Vexon, which is not widely known, a commando unit moved in on the craft, which did not fire at them. They reached the controls of the ship, where they found the bodies of three reptilian creatures. Pretending to be carrying out road work near the swamp, the Army discreetly moved the UFO to a secret government facility in Kanata under the cover of night. As for the mysterious creatures, they were supposedly secretly transported to the University of Ottawa, where CIA physiologists performed an autopsy on them. This incredible tale was accompanied by the topographical map of the area, as well as a photograph of one of the captured creatures. When he got wind of this amazing story, Graham Lightfoot, a local UFO researcher, headed to CARP to investigate for himself. I went to the area and on a Saturday, thinking people would be home, talked to eight to ten people, I just forget exactly, and uh, asked them had they seen anything over the swamp. So I talked to people who had the best view of that and nobody had seen anything and I was getting a bit frustrated so where else do I go so I turn go to the other side of the road and lo and behold found two people who had seen something one uh, turned out to be the Labanex and she told me that a bright light had been seen over the swamp as bright as a arc welding or electric welding at night time and it was at such and such an angle from her house. Later on the same day, I was further down the road and found another young, a younger lady who also told me she saw a bright light in the swamp behind her house and uh, disturbed the dogs. The light shone through their windows. So in talking to those people, they didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it was. 
interestingly, the story that was given with that, that report that there'd been a crash said that roads had been cut into the swamp to take out the, the downed UFO. And uh, even in the winter when I first looked at that, there was no way anybody had cut a road into that swamp. And, uh, you know, I sort of said, well, that part of it isn't true. Maybe somebody saw a bright light, but they certainly hadn't cut any roads in to retrieve anything from that swamp. Just when it appeared that this matter was fading into oblivion, further correspondence sparked the interest of CARP investigators once again. A year after the first anonymous package was sent, UFO researchers received another one, in which the author identified himself under the pseudonym Guardian, and said that he was a member of the Guardians of the Secrets of the Holy Grail. Other than a new story and various interesting clues, the package also contained a videotape showing a UFO that Guardian had filmed. Graham Lightfoot tells us what was on the tape. One of the things that was sent out was a video, a VHS video. And on the label of that video was the name Guardian, typewritten, with a fingerprint. And that sort of indicated, catch me if you can, or whatever, but a uh, curious way to send something with no, no names. But the documents that came with that also referred to Guardian. There were various documents sent to different people. Some had a story, others had, or in addition to the story, had playing cards with little notes written on there that DND &D and CSIS is involved and things like that. Uh, very curious, why would you send playing cards? Uh, it, it, it looked like a game. The only thing that made any sense was the background map happened to be the same area of Mannion's Corners that the 89 crash had been written about. The videotape that, that Guardian had sent starts off with flares or some sort of red light, four of them, burning nighttime picture. So it's totally black background with these four flares or red lights. And beside it, stationary, is a large, I'll say a large object. The only way you know there's anything there is the fact that it's illuminated from underneath. And it's a very, very bright, intense light. And on top of this structure, because it, it's apparent something was there, was a rotating or a flashing beacon. That video was filmed by someone holding the camera on their shoulder, presumably, walking towards it. Thinking that it was a hoax, Graham Lightfoot returned to CARP, accompanied by Canadian and U.S. researchers. He later discovered that there was a reason why they were being so helpful. Bob Exler from the United States had been contacted, and he contacted MUFON Ontario, and we all met in Carlton Place, I, and then I led them out to the site. And uh, we, there was about 12 or 14 of us that day. And my thought was that we would knock on doors to see if anybody, would split up the area and knock on doors to see if anybody had seen anything back on August the 18th of the previous year. We started to, we didn't knock on any doors, which I thought was a bit odd, but anyway, we, uh, we did walk around the area. <clears throat> a lot of the chaps were getting hot and tired, mosquito bites and all that sort of thing, and uh, they decided we'd all go for supper in, to Carp, to a pub in Carp. Bob Exler and his son Dan uh, said no, they were going to find the, the crash site and they were going to stick at it. Well, within half an hour, they showed up at the pub too. And oh, we found the site. So the rest of the chaps uh, were, were not happy with the way Exler was doing things. He seemed to have all the answers, had found the site now, when nobody else even knew where to look for the site. And uh, they more or less washed their hands of it and went home. On the other hand, I only live an hour away from that location, 
And I was curious enough to decide, well, I'm going to stick with it and see what's going on, see if we can find an answer. And <clears throat> since we had a, quote, expert from the U.S. here, let's see how an expert does it. <laughs> and uh, so we spent the next day uh, going around the area, and I finally convinced Exler, let's go and talk to Labanex, because Diane Labanex had seen the light from 89. I said, wouldn't it be, make sense to go and talk to her? Maybe she saw something. When we talked to the Labanex, and she told us that, yes, she had seen this spaceship, she called it a ship repeatedly, she saw fire, a fire in the grass. And yet it wasn't moving as it should, if it was a, a grass fire. And then she saw a ship or spaceship land, which is what was in the Guardian video. In the Guardian video, it didn't land, it was stationary, it was already on the ground. But Diane told us that she saw it land, and it sat there for a few minutes, and she could see a, a, a lightning strike, sort of a zigzag line on the side of the craft, and the lights and so on. And after a, a short while, it took off. And then when it took off and disappeared, the lights went out, the, the flares. Now, that's her story, but what she described matched pretty closely what Guardian had sent on his video. And at that time, Diane had not seen the video that we had been given. So it made sense that she was telling a pretty good story. As Graham Lightfoot and his colleagues inspected the site, they were unaware that they were being watched by another organization, also interested in the mysterious Guardian. Learning that a suspicious character was fabricating documents and attempting to pass them off as official reports of the Department of National Defense, the RCMP decided to carry out its own investigation. The RCMP came to the same conclusion as Graham Lightfoot, that Guardian was nothing more than a charlatan. According to the RCMP, the alleged UFO on the videotape was nothing more than a Sikorsky helicopter filmed in the dark. As for the identity of Guardian himself, Graham Lightfoot suspected that it was a UFO follower who was well known in the area. I think I know who Guardian is. Um, as I say, he's been known in the area for talking about UFOs for forever, for 40 years. Um, he has not admitted that to anyone to my knowledge. I have tried to see him, I've knocked on his door, because I know, I think I know who it is. But he won't even answer the door. So I, I think it was probably done as a game. When I say game, it was just fun, it was something to do. Um, can we do it? And uh, looking at the video, I, I'd say they did a pretty good job. Although the second-hand account of the carp incident was fairly simple to solve, others were much more complicated, like the Umo affair, a case so wrapped in mystery that many still doubt today that it could have been a hoax. One of the most ardent defenders of the Umo affair is Professor Jean-Pierre Petit, an astrophysicist and research director for the French National Center for Scientific Research, or CNRS. Petit literally shocked his colleagues in 1990 when he announced that some of his work had been inspired by Umite messages, a collection of typewritten letters that were primarily in Spanish. These letters were accentuated with odd words of so-called alien origin and signed by alleged visitors from the planet Ubo. What's interesting is what we do with our lives. I may be the only person interested in the subject of UFOs who published scientific articles in high-profile magazines about fluid mechanics, ionized gases, cosmology and geometry. Through reflection, I was able to produce high-quality material. What's published in UFO magazines nowadays is completely different. And I'm telling you that I was very inspired by the Omo letters. Jean Paulion, a computer scientist who is also interested in the Omo documents, agreed that they contained information of alien origin. 
In studying the Umite letters and the glossary of alien terms used in the documents, Jean Paulion concluded that they could not be a hoax. In his book, Umo, True Extraterrestrials, Paulion explains how he came to this conclusion. When I began working with these letters, I didn't know the theory surrounding them. All I had to go on was the information transcribed by Jean-Pierre Petit, and I wanted to find out more for myself, so I dug into the original source documents. These letters are difficult to read, and important information is never stated directly. It's only found by cross-referencing several of the documents. That means you need to spend a lot of time working with the documents, going through each one carefully and comparing them to each other. These documents were disturbing to everyone, from UFO groups to the French National Space Research Center. No one wanted to admit that they supported this material, and that surprised me. Why was it so disturbing? Because people don't like to be led down unknown paths. Omite material was not designed for scientists or UFO researchers. It's targeted towards highly intellectual people. I have friends who are mathematicians, and when they glanced at the material, they found it interesting and highly intellectual. Just look at the work done by Pouillon, which was not done for amateurs. It was very highbrow. It required thousands of hours of work. So you can't make a judgment on his work based on a cursory glance of it, especially if you don't have the required qualifications. To fully understand the scope and complexity of the UMO mystery, we need to go back to where it all began in Madrid, Spain in the mid-1960s. The key figure involved was Fernando Sesma, a Spaniard who claimed to have been in contact with extraterrestrials from Venus and Mars since the 1950s, as well as other inhabitants of the solar system. Then, along came the Umites. In actual fact, Sesma's group, the Happy Whale Club, existed long before the Umo mystery began. Sesma was interested in extraterrestrials and other esoteric subjects. A group of people would come to listen to him tell stories in the basement of a coffee shop in Madrid, where there was a huge smiling whale painted on the wall. Sesma was contacted by telephone on January 14, 1966. He then began receiving letters confirming the existence of UMO and letting him know that the next Umite craft would be landing in Aluche on February 6, three weeks after the first mail delivery. The letters were sent to Sesma, who spoke about them and mixed up the contents of the letters. Supposedly, the Umites did not appreciate him mixing things up, so they intentionally began adding technical information to make him lose interest. Sesma was a dreamer, not a scientist. So a lot of the technical information was over his head. Once the letters began to be filled with equations, Sesma started to lose interest, but people were still coming to hear about them, like engineer Enrique Biagrasa and Dr. Aguirre. These gentlemen and others began to receive the letters directly, and gradually they formed their own group, the famous Madrid group. They disassociated themselves from the Happy Whale Club, which continued to show interest in esoteric matters such as planets where butterflies laid eggs that hatched baby ducks. That's the sort of thing that Sesma cared about. After two to three years, they were no longer interested in UMO at all. In exchange for a modest sum, Sesma turned over all of his UMO documents to Ferrials. The Umite mail packages, which bore an emblem resembling a letter of the Cyrillic alphabet, explained that they had been living on Earth since the 1950s. They were part of a scouting mission sent to Earth from a planet in the Virgo cluster, and the contents of the letters were designed to help advance humanity. The first Umite packages were received by Fernando Sesma in 1966. He received several dozen letters each year for many years. Over time, the Umites found other human contacts. Spanish, French, British, and even American representatives began receiving these odd packages. The last Umite correspondence was received in the mail in 1995. 
les choses ne sont invraisemblables que quand on le prouve. Something is real until it's proven otherwise. These letters exist. I'm in the process of proving that they cannot stem from a human hoax because of all the ramifications that would involve. The contents of the letters themselves also prove it. I'm telling you that they are alien in origin because I have found strong proof within them to support that claim. They contain 1,345 words and more than 400 expressions, more or less coherent, that correspond to a language system having a base of 18 elements. That's quite something. It's real. And these Umite reports contain scientific information that we have started to study on the Internet. When I say we, I mean a study group that was created to review my work. This group now has more than 100 members throughout the world, primarily university students. Martin Castello co-authored The Star Conspiracy, an investigation into the Umo affair. She was surprised to find that this odd story seemed to circulate under a cloak of secrecy, even among university students. I was a science journalist working for Figaro, and I was in charge of the science page. I had to prepare an article on a scientist named Jean-Pierre Luminet, who had written about black holes. So I went to Meudon to see him. Since he was a longtime friend of mine, once the interview was over, I asked him jokingly, Jean-Pierre, have you ever heard of Humo? He grabbed me, and then he led me into the hallway and said, be careful where you talk about that. Yes, of course, I studied the letters when I was younger along with several other scientists. I examined the letters carefully and I pondered over the equations. I couldn't believe what he was telling me. The next week, I had to give another interview for Figaro. I went to Oxford, or, or maybe it was Cambridge, I don't recall, to see Stephen Hawking, who had just released a new book. Stephen Hawking is a physicist restricted to a wheelchair due to Lou Gehrig's disease. At the end of the interview, I asked him the same question. Have you ever heard of Humo? With one finger, he typed the word yes on the computer. I couldn't believe it, so I asked him if he could tell me more about it. He adamantly replied no and wheeled away. The interview was over. Although some researchers are incredibly enthusiastic about Humo, others see it as nothing more than a very clever hoax. It's true that the whole thing has some suspicious elements such as a series of photographs of an Umite craft. In 1967, the Umites announced in a mail package that one of their ships would be arriving soon. Then, on June 1, 1967, an airship flew over the San Jose de Valderas area of Madrid. By the strangest of coincidences, a couple of photographers just happened to be at that location and took several pictures of the object. Interestingly, once the pictures were published in a major Madrid newspaper, the two photographers vanished into thin air, as if they had never existed. Jean-Jacques Velasco, director of France's UFO research group, SEPRA, recalls that an investigation was carried out by his predecessor. Yes, this matter pops up now and then. We hear about it in the media. It's quite simple, really. Our UFO research group was called Japan at the time, and our director, Claude Boer, discovered that a number of people in southern France were receiving strange packages in the mail. In these packages, the recipients found photographs of bizarre things happening in the sky. Claude Poer had one of the pictures analyzed, and it was shown that the photograph was nothing more than a model suspended from a nylon thread. An independent investigation led by ground Saucer Watch, an organization specializing in photo analysis, confirmed Poher's conclusions. By digitizing one of the photos taken in San Jose de Valderas, the experts had no trouble detecting the thread suspending the alleged UFO. Another controversial element was the quality of the information provided by the Umites. According to Jean-Pierre Petit, the extraordinary things mentioned in the letters proved their alien origin. But was the information truly ahead of its time, as he claims? For example, Professor Petit said that the first packages from the Umites, dating back to 1962, 
contained references to parallel universes, which most physicists believe are composed of antimatter. Professor Petit claimed that no one on Earth could have imagined such a concept back in 1962. He used the same argument for magnetic hydrodynamics, or MHD, a principle of propulsion that consists of moving an object within a dense atmosphere by wrapping it in a sort of magnetic cocoon. Petit said that when the Umayyad reports mentioned MHD, it was a highly revolutionary principle for its time. Jean-Pierre Petit's main problem is a question of dates. The first Umayyad letters did not date back to 1962, but rather 1966. As for the scientific information, it didn't start appearing in the Umayyad reports until the late 1960s. Human discussions of parallel universes date back to 1967, when the idea was first proposed by Russian physicist Andrei Sakharov. Same thing for MHD. In 1966, as the UMO affair was just beginning, an American team was carrying out successful testing of a submarine powered by magnetic energy. In other words, contrary to what Jean-Pierre Petit claims, there was nothing revolutionary and probably nothing alien about the Umite reports. The scientific information that Jean-Pierre Petit found in the Umite reports is undeniable and indisputable. It's there. He may have been a bit off with his dates, but what counts is the details of the information that he found. It's a fact that MHD was discussed in the Umayyad documents. It was just not discussed in the same terms as those interpreted by Jean-Pierre Petit. In my opinion, it was not being discussed as a means of propulsion, but rather as a source of energy. The Umayyad letters are like a key capable of accessing the reader's intuition. They contain a lot of hidden information, and it took an imaginative mind like Jean-Pierre Petit's to find the building blocks of the ideas being expressed. Researchers everywhere did the same thing. I don't think the Umites gave any explicit explanations, and I feel that Jean-Pierre Petit underestimated the importance of his work. He was able to find two or three concepts in the reports due to his imagination and scientific intellect. What he accomplished was not easy, and it was a lot of hard work. The Umite letters stimulated his imagination. Everything that he came out with was not stated explicitly in the Umite reports. They only gave pointers. The question remains. Who wrote the Umayyad reports? If it's true that they were nothing more than a hoax, then it is generally agreed that they must have been produced by a well-managed organization. But who and why? In 1993, one of the key players in the Umo affair, Jose Luis Jordan Peña, admitted to having written the Umayyad letters. As an engineer, Peña had the knowledge required to have written these reports. But did he work alone or did he have accomplices? Peña's confessions did not convince everyone, and especially not Professor Petit. Peña's confession came at a time when I had just received a package in the mail from Saudi Arabia, signed by the Omites, proposing that we meet. Who knows if it would have come about or not, but it was aborted due to an error made by Farioles. That was when Peña began acting odd, saying all sorts of things, like the fact that he had written the Umayyad documents. I was at Rafael Farioles' house when he and Peña discussed the matter. They had known each other for about 20 years, and by announcing that he had written the documents, Peña had made Farioles look like a fool. So Farioles was very upset, you know how Spaniards can get when they're angry. That's when I heard Peña say to Farioles, don't be mad. Raphael, the Omites were the ones who told me to do it. Who are we to believe? Aliens flying on a craft suspended from a nylon thread? Who order their agents to lie on their behalf to preserve their anonymity? Or Jose Luis Jordan Peña, a man tired of the 25-year cat and mouse game he'd been playing with UFO researchers who had been desperately trying to determine his identity. Will we ever learn all of the details surrounding the UMO affair? It may linger on as nothing more than a dream until we get some definite answers, but we never will. The Umo affair is one of life's mysteries, like the quest for the Holy Grail. In the mid-1990s, Raymond Santilli, a London-based film distributor, publicly announced that he had just laid his hands on a film showing an alien autopsy. According to Santilli, the film had been taped by a former U.S. Air Force cameraman, who had turned over the 16 millimeter reels. I think it, it, it's suspicious that I was not invited 
to the original showing of the film, and even months before I tried to contact Ray Santilli, he ignored my requests to uh, see the film. I'm convinced it's quite a clever fabrication done by various individuals, and I'm sure that their names will be known in, in due course. Now, Santilli, of course, maintains that it's genuine and that he's withholding more footage and so on and so forth. He talks about having supplied bits of the film for analysis, but he has never supplied any actual frames from the film for proper analysis. The day after the autopsy film was first shown in 1995, several people claimed that it contained proof that it had been filmed later than 1947, such as the microphone hanging over the autopsy table and the telephone that appeared behind the doctors, which was said to be more recent models than those used in 1947. However, when we organized a private viewing at Bell Canada, technicians confirmed that the telephone was a 352, a commercial model used as early as 1941. As for the microphone, we checked with the technicians at Shore Brothers in Illinois, who advised us that the model in the film had been available on the market since 1942. In other words, there was no proof that the film had not been taped in 1947. Unable to prove that it was filmed later than 1947, analysts turned to a theory that it was possibly a clever trick, an argument countered by the exorbitant cost of such a production. Invited as an expert on a television program, Eric Gosselin said that he could prove this objection wrong. On the TV show, I was challenged to recreate the autopsy film, and I accepted the challenge. I created an alien that I had to open up an autopsy, as was done in the Santilli film. Eric Gosselin and his brother Carl produced a film whose sole purpose was to prove that Ray Santilli's alien autopsy could be recreated at a reasonable cost. Obviously, I didn't have two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars to invest in my production. On top of that, there was the question of when my version would be aired. I only had two weeks to put it all together. I managed to get it done within the two weeks for less than two thousand dollars. Even though they proved that it was possible to produce something similar to alien autopsy at a reasonable cost, the Gosselin brothers in no way proved that Santilli's film was a fake. Further proof was still needed. Santilli was still keeping quiet about the identity of the person who had taped the film. Finally, after being bombarded with questions, the film distributor said that it had been created by Jack Barnett, a cameraman who had also taped initial testing of the atomic bomb south of Trinity, New Mexico. Research showed that only two cameramen were authorized to film those famous tests and neither one of them fit the description given by Ray Santilli. The British producer also claimed that his film had been analyzed by the Kodak Film Company, who supposedly confirmed that it did indeed date back to 1947. There was something not quite right about this. We got in touch with Peter Nielsen, the person at Kodak's England office who had performed this alleged analysis. He wrote to us explaining that he never analyzed Santilli's film. However, he did admit to having studied a piece of film submitted by the British producer. It was a blank piece of celluloid used to hold the film on its reel. Based on the specific code appearing on this celluloid, Nielsen wrote that it was possible that it had been removed from a film dating back to 1947. He also cautioned that since it was void of any image, there was no way of proving that it had come from the autopsy film. Santilli distributes old American movies and could have easily taken this celluloid from any production dating back to 1947. No one has ever seen the actual film that the autopsy was taped on. Santilli generally shows the film on magnetic media with the pretext that the original reels are safely locked in a vault. He is, however, more than happy to show people the metal cases in which he keeps the reels. One of them has a suspicious looking label. Other than a few mundane markings, the label bears the official stamp of the American Department of Defense. This raises two points. 
Firstly, if the film was never turned over to the Air Force in the first place, then why does it bear their stamp? Secondly, upon checking with the National Archives Office in Washington, D.C., it was discovered that this stamp was not made official by the U.S. President until October 1947, at least four months after the autopsy film was taped. A flaw in the film date had finally been found. John Spencer has written many books on UFOs, including an encyclopedia. For many years, he also headed the British UFO Research Association, or BUFORA, the largest UFO group in Great Britain. Now, I have to say that there is so much evidence that it's a fake that that's where my feeling is. Um, the, the way in which it came to light, the way in which the whole film is shot, it has a certain theatricalness about it. And when we compare it to actual autopsies done at the time and so on, actually it's not that good. Um, it's not the way it would be done and so on. So there's an awful lot wrong with, with that film. The question that, of course, is, is paramount, I suppose, is was Ray Santilli the person who faked it or was he a victim of the hoaxer himself? And, and on that question, I think the jury's out. In the police world, it is well known that to find a culprit, you need to know who is profiting from the crime. To date, it is estimated that Raymond Santilli has made about $7 million on his autopsy film. P.T. Barnum is credited with saying, a fool is born every minute. If P.T. Barnum was alive today, the showman would certainly be amused to see that one of his exhibits was passed off as an alien hand. The television networks paid several thousand dollars to show the autopsy of a rubber mannequin, and that scientists are poring over letters of questionable alien origin in the hopes of finding revolutionary new ideas. If P.T. Barnum was alive today, he would no doubt be working in the field of UFOs. It is said that UFOs have always been an ongoing concern for the Army, both in the U.S. and abroad. Military commanders have even classified this subject as ultra-top secret. Are these rumors true? Are UFOs really a state secret? On December 30th, 1947, faced with a growing number of UFO sightings being reported throughout the country, Defense Secretary James Forrestal set up an investigation committee. The Air Technical Intelligence Center, or ATIC, was located at the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio. The committee was known as Project Sign. Before it even had time to determine protocol, the U.S. Air Force was faced with a crisis. On the afternoon of January 7, 1948, barely a week after Project Sign had been created, Thomas Mantell, a pilot with the National Guard, crashed in his P-51 while pursuing a large silver-colored sphere over Kentucky. This incident was the first to be investigated by Project Psy. According to investigators, Mantell mistook Venus for an unknown craft. He was not wearing an oxygen mask, so he must have gone beyond a safe altitude, lost consciousness, and crashed to the ground. This explanation was far from convincing to military commanders. In 1952, the Mantell case was investigated by the U.S. Air Force, who concluded that the pilot had probably mistaken a skyhook balloon for a UFO. There's a significance to Mantell, which is very important, I think, and that is that the Mantell case came in the 1940s, just after the birth of the flying saucer phenomenon, if you like, when Kenneth Arnold had uh, named the flying saucers. And I think it's important to recognize the power of that image that Arnold created because of what happened to Mantell, a sober, sensible, normal pilot who appears, let's say he did make a mistake, he was led on by the, by the publicity and the hype into this new phenomenon. And it said a lot about how much of a grip this had on the American public in the 1940s. It looked like it could be a quick fad, but of course it, it hasn't been. But the Mantell case was one of the first deaths really associated with the subject and huge publicity. The publicity generated by the Mantell case only added to the problems of Project Sign. The situation went from bad to worse as more and more UFOs were sighted across the country. On July 24th, 1948, two pilots with Eastern Airlines reported having seen a bright cylinder-shaped object while flying over Alabama. Apparently, they barely avoided a collision. Things were getting tense for military commanders. They ordered Project Sign to produce a report assessing the current state of the situation. 
What we do know about Project Sign is that right from the beginning, analysts over at uh, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, were divided as to what UFOs meant. Some said, yes, I believe this is evidence of extraterrestrial interplanetary aircraft. This was not necessarily a minority viewpoint. There were, however, others that said, no, no, that's impossible. It cannot be that. It must be something on the fringes of science that we don't yet understand. Um, now, what appears to have shaken the sign team up were a series of very important sightings that took place in the summer of 1948. One was in uh, the Netherlands, and a few days later in the United States, um, in Alabama, uh, one took place of seemingly an identical object. In both cases, it was an object that had a uh, very exceptional speed, was seen clearly visually by uh, p trained pilots, and did things that aircraft weren't supposed to be able to do. The sign team apparently was very impressed by this and wrote what has been called the estimate of the situation. Now, we should state that no copy of the estimate has ever surfaced. Um, I think that the evidence is good that it did exist. There are some very reputable people who have gone on the line to say, yes, I've read it, I know it's in it. Basically, the estimate was a document that the sign team wrote up that said, yes, UFOs are real, we believe they're interplanetary. This was a document that landed on the desk of Air Force General Hoyt Vandenberg. According to the story, Vandenberg said, I'm not going to accept this conclusion. Give me something different. Uh, whereupon the sign team came back and gave him something different. Uh, and after that, the, in, the extraterrestrial thesis went out of favor among Project Sign. Supposedly, after rejecting the initial conclusions of the estimate of the situation, which stated that the flying saucers could be extraterrestrial in origin, General Hoyt S. Vandenberg gave the order to burn all copies of the report. In February 1949, ATIC submitted a new official report, which contained no reference whatsoever to extraterrestrials. However, the document did state that 20% of the sighted objects had not been identified. The Pentagon reacted by replacing Project Sign with another group, whose job was to minimize sightings of questionable objects. This group was known as Project Grudge. The Dark Age had begun. Eleven months later, an announcement was made that UFOs were nothing more than a case of mistaken identification, mass hysteria, or hoaxes. Military commanders knew better. In September 1951, after extraordinary sightings were reported over New Jersey, the U.S. Air Force revived its project grudge. Captain Edward Ruppelt was assigned to the project. But unlike his predecessors, Ruppelt refused to turn a blind eye to the UFO phenomenon. He demanded that thorough investigations be carried out, which led to the creation of Project Blue Book in 1952. The arrival of Captain Ruppelt held in a new wave of public interest in UFOs. It was hoped that Ruppelt would ensure that UFO investigations were impartial. Ruppelt hired a scientific advisor, Joseph Allen Hynek, an astrophysicist affiliated with Northwestern University in Illinois. Unfortunately, political winds changed direction in July 1952, when UFOs were sighted over the nation's capital. General John Samford, spokesman for the U.S. Air Force, held a press conference and stated that the lights were nothing more than a natural phenomenon created by temperature inversions. This explanation was hardly convincing. Several federal agencies, including the CIA, were demanding a meeting. They feared that the flying saucer mania would lead to mass hysteria throughout the country. When this meeting was finally held in January 1953, the CIA explained that it was vital to convince the public that UFOs were nothing more than hoaxes or a case of mistaken identification. 
the U.S. Air Force instructed Ruppelt to direct his efforts towards this goal. Project Blue Book became nothing more than a public relations agency. Ruppelt resigned a few months later, fed up with his new orders. Project Blue Book evolved out of the former Project Sign, which then became something known as Project Grudge, and that became Project Blue Book in the spring of 1952. The reason it did is because of the upsurge of UFO sightings that took place at that time. It was, uh, it was decided that um, this project required a little bit more status within the Air Force chain of command, and it became Blue Book. Captain Ruppelt headed up Project Blue Book for about two years in 1952-53. He led several good investigations, but there was a crisis situation in 1952, following the Washington merry-go-round incident, as it was known. For two weekends in a row on both Saturday and Sunday nights, the skies over Washington, D.C. were filled with UFOs, and this needed to be downplayed. A large press conference was held in Washington, during which the military claimed that the objects were nothing more than mirages, but this explanation was not very convincing. There was a change in policy within the organization, and studies into UFOs were brought to a halt. That's when Ruppelt decided to resign from Project Blue Book. Your job became to explain away. We know this because of now declassified documents that uh, lay out the matter very clearly to the Blue Book staff, which is, you know, if, if you have something that is easily explainable, this is what you tell the public. If you have something that is not easily explainable, don't talk about it to the public. It was a very clear recommendation. Their job was to get the unexplained percentage to an absolute rock bottom minimum. The goal of Project Blue Book was now to find natural explanations for UFO sightings. A key player in this game was Alan Hynek, an astronomer who worked on the project for nearly 20 years until the end of the 1960s. It was basically the first official investigation into the reports of UFOs. Um, there was no actual Blue Book, but Blue Book um, amounted to the code name for all the UFO reports being collected together and examined by the university, apparently independent of the government. In fact, it was more independent than the government probably intended because Hynek was gamekeeper turned poacher. He eventually became one of the leading lights of the UFO industry. And indeed, for some time, he was kind of playing a double game. But it took into account mainly lights in the sky and distant objects, uh, flying saucers, if you would. But it also in it took in the high strangeness cases, such as the, the, the cases of um, entities seen in Kentucky, for example, in 1955 and so on. And it would examine several of those kind of reports. It was, to some extent, a cover-up. They already had determined, the CIA had already determined, that they were interested in certain aspects of the UFO phenomenon, such as how rumour circulated amongst the population and so on. So it was a study of a lot of that aspect as well. It was, in effect, though, the first US government study. And it, it would lead on, in, in the end, to the Condom Report in 1969 in governments uh, uh, in, in, in due course. Up until the mid-1960s, Project Blue Book played its role as a public relations agency, downplaying UFO sightings and reassuring the public that flying saucers were nothing more than natural phenomena. Then in the spring of 1966, UFOs descended on three Michigan towns, Ann Arbor, Dexter, and Hillsdale. The U.S. Air Force quickly dispatched Alan Hynek to the scene. The astrophysicist proposed that the phenomena had been caused by methane swamp gases. It was the beginning of the end for Project Blue Book. The swamp gas incident that uh, occurred in the 1960s, and which was particularly uh, brought to, to bear by um, Professor Alan Hynek, who wrote it up in his book, The Hynek UFO Reports and so on, basically in Ann Arbor in Michigan, there were a lot of reports of lights and so on in the skies. Uh, Looking back on that now, we might assume that if they weren't structured craft and so on, which was obviously speculated by the UFO people at the time, that they might be something more like tectonic activity that we've seen in places like Hestelan and so on, where we think that uh, uh, sort of earth movements are causing these lights. But at the time, these lights were thought to be 
some sort of phenomenon at Ann Arbor. And a re an explanation was given, which wasn't that absurd, really, which was that it could be igniting swamp gas that was creating the light. Unfortunately, it was kind of picked up by the tabloids of the time and so on. And, and they made a big point about what seemed to be the government explaining away UFOs as just swamp gas. And I think the government has done some stupid things, and they ha quite rightly are pulled up by this. But in fact, on this occasion, it may not have been that silly a case. Having said that, um, that would what happens when you get flaps like that, like Warminster, like uh, Hesterland, um, Gulf Breeze, Ann Arbor, and so on, is that you've probably got real UFO incidents there. And these other things get seen by people who get very excited, and then the whole thing becomes a flap. And of course, a lot of nonsense gets into the data reported. I think there were probably some real cases in there, but unfortunately the whole thing became a complete fiasco because of this so-called cover-up of using the swamp gas explanation. Dissatisfied with Hynek's explanations, the press hounded Project Blue Book for the truth. In the midst of the upheaval, military commanders set up an ad hoc committee made up of military officers and scientists. They concluded that it would be best for a civil agency to take over, relieving the army once and for all of its UFO problem. The Air Force dumped the problem into the lap of the University of Colorado. So uh, basically what had happened is that Project Blue Book had lost all credibility at this point. Uh, the U.S. Air Force had lost credibility on this project. Uh, people weren't believing the Air Force answers that it was all weather balloons or it was all ball lightning or some other kind of, uh, you know, the planet Venus every single time. So that uh, what the Air Force wanted to do and had wanted to do for years was to get rid of Project Blue Book somehow. Um, their problem had always been that they had conceded that UFOs might represent a problem of national security and defense. And therefore, they could not come up with a good excuse for getting rid of Blue Book. If they couldn't, if they couldn't say that, uh, you know, there's no security problem. They, they, they were backed into a corner, in other words. So what they did was, in 1966, hand the ball over to the University of Colorado, a very carefully selected uh, institution, I might add, to study this matter once and for all, it was believed, in a scientific matter. Um, the Colorado Project, also known uh, throughout history as the Condon Committee, uh, lasted for about two years. Now, at the end of that time, the Condon Committee decided that UFOs were not uh, worthy of scientific inquiry, essentially nonsense, and that the Air Force should drop Project Blue Book. The problem with the Colorado Project uh, was that its director, Edward Condon, although he was a world-renowned physicist, really knew nothing about UFOs, didn't want to know anything about UFOs, and was uh, wrapped up with uh, studying the crackpot cases and had uh, stated his position long uh, before the project ended that it was all nonsense, long before they were supposed to have any conclusions. He was already stating them to the, pr to the public, to the press. Um, there uh, was essentially midway through the project, project uh, a mutiny among many of its members who realized that this was a problem. They realized that the director was preordaining a negative conclusion. Uh, matters came to a head and uh, many of the staffers were fired midway through. There's also a memorandum uh, issued by the second in command of the project, uh, a man by the name of Robert Lowe, who in 1966, at the beginning of the project, wrote an, an internal only memo, which said that uh, the trick of what we do will be to uh, you know, convince other scientists that we are actually engaging in a serious study of this pro uh, project when in reality we have no expectation of finding anything at all. And that memo uh, leaked out about a year into the project and caused a very, very big uh, controversy. So there were things like this that showed that the, the project um, may not have been uh, an impartial study. Certainly if you review the Condon Committee report, there are many deep flaws with it. It is a deeply, deeply flawed scientific document. The conclusions did not matched the data. Um, uh, some reports were well investigated, others were not. Um, and so that it's, it was a very spotty report. For a document that was supposed to solve the UFO controversy, it did not do it. Now, none of that really seemed to matter. 
The Condon Committee report was released in uh, January of 1969, and the press basically said, oh, okay, nothing to it, end of story. The Air Force said, thank you very much, uh, we're done with Project Blue Book. By the end of the year, Project Blue Book had been disbanded. So in a sense, the Condon Committee was messy, but it did the job. The conclusions of Project Colorado were so incoherent that people wondered whether Dr. Condon had even bothered to read the report before drawing his own conclusions. Once the Condon report was released and Project Blue Book was disbanded, the U.S. Air Force disassociated itself with the UFO issue. Officially, that is. After 1969, the U.S. Air Force uh, has continued to maintain that it no longer investigates reports of unidentified flying objects or UFOs. Uh, this has been its consistent uh, position now for uh, over 30 years. This is patently untrue. Uh, we know, for instance, uh, that there have been many intrusions of sensitive airspace uh, that took place in the 1970s over the uh, U.S. northern border, border and in Canada at the Falcon Ridge uh, Air Force Base in Ontario. Uh, many air, airspace violations along the U.S. northern border in November of 1975. And this received significant attention by the U.S. military. We know that they investigated it. We also have a memo from 1969 by General Carol Bolander, which stated uh, that the, the important UFO files that affected national security were not part of the Blue Book system. He was very clear about this. So that um, certainly, there is um, a, a, more than sufficient reason to believe that UFO investigations continue. There have been uh, discussions of uh, possible projects such as uh, Aquarius, another project known as Moondust, and others. Uh, projects such as these that have been said to exist, and uh, I think such projects probably do exist. It's hard for me to say specifically for example, what was the uh, you know, history of Project Aquarius. We don't really have much information about this. And the documents that discuss Project Aquarius have themselves been disputed in their authenticity. It's very hard to know exactly uh, what, what, what it was about. What is clear is that examination and study and investigation of UFOs has continued to the present day. <laughs> Today, the U.S. Air Force claims that all files relating to UFO sightings are available in national archives. But we have reason to believe that these archives are only the tip of the iceberg. There are a number of astronauts I know who take this very seriously. I've spoken to Dr. Edgar Mitchell, who was the sixth man to walk on the moon, Apollo 14. He's told me he is convinced that there is a cover-up, and the, that the United States has covered up information about a lot, including Roswell, for over 50 years, and that the information is now held by a group that has spun off from the military intelligence organizations of the past. Gordon Cooper um, has a great interest in the subject. I've communicated with him. He has confirmed that when he was director of the Flight Test Center at Edwards Air Force Base, California in the late 1950s, a disc actually landed. It extended land, tripod landing gear and landed on the dry lake bed and was filmed by his camera crew, which were filming various experimental flights at that time. He's confirmed that the disc was around 30 feet in diameter. He did not see this event, but he studied the film and he was ordered to send it by a pouch to Washington, and uh, it hasn't been seen or heard of, of since. Even though more than 30 years have elapsed since Project Blue Book, chances are that the U.S. Air Force still has several UFO files locked in the vault somewhere. State secrets that will remain secret for years to come. After the Second World War, most NATO countries looked to the U.S. to solve the UFO problem. But that didn't stop them from carrying out their own investigations. In the early 1950s, the Canadian Air Force and the Department of Transportation held several meetings to discuss UFOs. 
These meetings were known as Project Second Story. In March 1953, the committee concluded that there wasn't anything in the UFO file worth pursuing. Up until 1967, when the Canadian Army released its UFO files to National Archives, the military had done only a few cursory investigations to ensure that the sightings were not a risk to national security. Even today, the Army is keeping a discreet eye on UFO sightings, but only for security reasons. It keeps a close watch on air traffic. We know that all civil air traffic control towers throughout the country keep a UFO sighting checklist. When an air traffic controller receives a phone call from the public or from a pilot who has seen something strange in the sky, the controller must fill out a report and send it to the 22nd in North Bay, an underground military base that monitors the entire Canadian airspace and works closely with the Cheyenne military base in Colorado. These are the basics that we know that anyone can find out. There's nothing hidden. It's all part of monitoring the Canadian territory. Whenever the Army detects an object flying in the Canadian airspace that refuses to identify itself and to respond to radio calls, it has strict instructions to send up fighter jets to intercept the object. In our case, these jets are CF-18As, otherwise known as Hornets, and they're usually launched from the third wing at the Bagotville military base. The Hornet's job is to intercept, identify, and accompany an aircraft such as a Russian Tupolev to the international airspace where it belongs once it responds to the call sign. If the object does not respond at all, the Army's last resort is to fire at the object with the intention of destroying it because that's the Army's job. And I think it's important to note that there's a difference between what we think the military does and what it actually does. It can be summed up in three letters, IID, intercept, identify, and destroy. That's what the military does. That's what they're paid to do. I would say that UFOs are pretty far down on their list of concerns. They're not paid to study UFOs. That's not their job. And I would even go so far as to say that they scoff at the whole idea of UFOs. As long as national security is not in danger, they will come up with a story about how something strange was spotted in the sky, and the story will end there. The information will be passed on to the NORAD base in Cheyenne, Colorado, but nothing more will be done about it. Towards the end of the 1970s, all of the information was being passed on to the Hertzberg Institute in Ottawa, which would put the information together. Then the RCMP would create a file from the information gathered. This process ended around 1995-96 due to cuts by Brian Mulroney's conservative government, and nothing has been happening since. This means that the public shouldn't expect the military to be launching any intensive investigations into the UFO phenomenon. In the Canadian history of ufology, there was one case in particular that caught the attention of the Canadian forces. A strange flying machine was spotted by prospector Stephen Michalak near Falcon Lake, Manitoba in 1967. Stephen Michalak was a, uh, an engineer, uh, a very humble man, an immigrant from Poland from, uh, uh, from uh, the time of the war. And in 1967, he was doing some amateur prospecting uh, in a uh, very remote area of Manitoba. Uh, not, not too remote to be completely inaccessible. In fact, uh, just a matter of miles away from a, a very busy highway, but yet um, off the beaten track. He had said that he was um, taking a break, eating his lunch, and uh, had started to chip away at a rock formation uh, because there was much silver and gold uh, and other minerals in the area. In fact, he had stated claims uh, to that effect previously that he had seen an object, silver in color, about 35 feet in diameter, shaped like a flying saucer, like we would imagine from a Hollywood uh, movie, uh, to land on a rock outcropping not that far away from him, shining very, very bright lights out of uh, openings in its turret, its little dome. Uh, 
Um, after a while, a little door opened in the side of it, and he could see light coming from that too. What is interesting is that he had not conceived that this was a, a, a spacecraft from outer space. He thought immediately that this must have been some sort of American flying vehicle uh, that uh, was top secret and had broken down and they had to make repairs so that nobody would see. So he walked up to the craft uh, a little ways away and shouted out, Hey Yankee boys, what's the matter? Your, your secret aircraft broke down? I'll give you a hand fixing it. What had happened was, previous to him saying this, he had heard some voices coming out of this opening, thinking that they were humans, perhaps. As soon as he called out to them, the voices stopped. And he thought, oh no, maybe this isn't Americans. So he called out in Russian, <laughs> because he was fluent in a number of languages, asking the same thing. Still no response. He tried German and his native tongue Polish as well. He walked up to the doorway, put his hand, his gloved hand, he had rubberized gloves for dealing with rock chips on the side of the uh, craft, still thinking it was some sort of secret aircraft, and had to pull away because the gloves melted because the heat was so intense on the outside of this vehicle. The door shut like a camera iris, woof, 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 like this. And the whole object rose up slightly and began to turn so that there was a, an exhaust vent, uh, like a radiator grill, in front of him. And a blast of hot gas hit him in the chest and the object took off. The blast of hot gas was hot enough that it actually set his clothes on fire. And he quickly struggled to take off the clothes, throw them onto the ground and beat them out um, with some, uh, uh, some grass and some leaves and stomp on them. But he started feeling very, very dizzy and nauseous, and he was in pain. He did receive second and third degree burns. Um, he managed to walk out of the bush um, uh, to where he was staying at a small motel a few miles away, uh, and decided that he would go back into Winnipeg seeking some medical help. He arrived in Winnipeg uh, a few hours later and had called his um, family to meet him at the hospital because he told them he had been burned by an aircraft. Um, the doctors at the hospital in Winnipeg treated him for the burns and uh, didn't know what to make of, of some of his other effects. He was dizzy, he was vomiting, he was uh, um, very much out of sorts. Only later did he actually explained to his family what had happened and he thought that because this was some sort of secret aircraft and perhaps it wasn't a, a Canadian or American craft that it was some other device that he should tell authorities about this so he contacted one of the newspapers in Winnipeg and told a reporter about his experience and uh, when the reporter heard the fantastic story uh, it broke all across Canada in fact around the world and it became one of the most intensely investigated uh, reports uh, uh, in all of North America at first the authorities turned over the investigation to Sergeant Paul Biskey of the Canadian Air Force his report was filled with contradictions Biskey recognized that Mikulak was honest Yet he remained convinced that the whole thing was nothing more than a hoax or a hallucination. Bisky was very much against the notion of flying saucers. In fact, um, he, uh, in a, an interesting letter uh, which we have found on file, uh, described how he was going to get Mr. Michalek drunk at a bar to try and loosen his lips to come forth with the truth about what happened. Um, he was looking for any explanation, any reason why what Mikuluk had said really didn't occur. And uh, I believe was a, a, a detriment to the investigation. Perhaps dedicated, but he was so convinced that uh, the case could not have occurred that perhaps he went a little bit overboard in his evaluation. <laughs> Bisky's conclusions were not accepted unanimously by the authorities, especially since radioactive ground samples were taken from the site. 
I actually grew up very close to uh, where Mr. Mihalik lived. In fact, uh, I, as a child, I played with one of his sons. And I remember uh, his son telling me one time that his father had been burned and, and was very, very sick. And I didn't think anything of it at the time. But later on, as I continued my connection and relationship with the family, I became interested in the UFOs and, and flying saucers and asked more questions about what had happened. And he showed me the burns um, on his legs and, and uh, what was left on his body at that time, some of the material that had been left, and told me of his fantastic story. So he, on the one hand, we have a fantastic story. Uh, but it is backed up by some physical evidence, some material on the ground, the evidence of the um, burns on his body, plus the astounding testimony and uh, expert testimony of some of the investigators. So I suppose, depending on who you talk to, it's either um, uh, one of the best cases ever on record of a person encountering a flying saucer and being burned by it, physically injured, or an elaborate hoax. And if it is an elaborate hoax, it is surely one of the most profound ever on record with the most incredible evidence. The Mikulak case was never really explained. Even today, 35 years later, part of the Mikulak file is still inaccessible, classified as a state secret by national defense. In Europe, there is no Freedom of Information Act, so it is difficult to assess the role of the military with regards to UFOs. We do know that the British government has always been interested in UFOs. Between 1991 and 1994, Nick Pope was in charge of studying reports of UFO sightings. Between 1991 and 1994, my job at the Ministry of Defence was to research and investigate UFO sightings, to evaluate them, to see if there was evidence of a threat to the defence of the United Kingdom. So I would receive between two and three hundred reports each year, and I would have to, to the best of my ability, to look at each one of these, to consider all the possible alternatives, and to try and find a conventional explanation. Now, I managed to find a conventional explanation with 90 or 95 percent of these sightings, but that left me with a, a hard core which I couldn't explain by conventional means. I had that particular job for three years, um, but in various forms, that job or something very much like it has existed uh, since 1950, and uh, the work does continue to this day. Having said that, I think over the years, the way in which the subject has been treated has varied enormously. Um, sometimes due to the um, attitudes or belief of whoever is doing the job at the time. So I, for example, uh, was quite involved in the subject because I thought it was worthy uh, of interest. Others, I think, over the years have taken a less involved view. The British Ministry of Defence has been interested in UFOs since 1950. The Churchill administration was concerned with the US situation, and the British press were a bunch of fear mongers. Military commanders were questioning the nature of these flying saucers. Could they be a new weapon being developed by the Russians? Yes. The British government's interest in UFOs dates back to about 1950. And at that time, clearly, we were aware of the situation in America um, with Kenneth Arnold's flying saucer sightings. And we knew, of course, uh, that Project Sign uh, had been set up and Project Grudge, and, and that, of course, evolved into Project Blue Book. In 1950, um, a very eminent scientist in the British government, Sir Henry Tizard, uh, one of the founding 
fathers of radar technology, felt that UFO reports could not be dismissed and should not be dismissed without some form of, of proper investigation. And so the Air Force um, and Air Force Intelligence was tasked with setting up uh, a working party to look into this. This was known as the Flying Saucer Working Party. It formed in 1950 and it reported formally its conclusions in 1951. Its conclusions were quite sceptical and drew heavily on the American party line, that these things were generally either misidentifications or hoaxes. Having said that, um, when it reported and recommended that no further action was taken, a year or so later, uh, this was overturned because of a high-profile series of UFO sightings involving the military. But that is how the official interest started. Between, uh, once, once the uh, Air Ministry and the Ministry of Defence had set up um, a small unit to look into these UFO sightings, um, that project ran uh, and indeed to a certain extent still runs to this day. And uh, the, the job that I did between 1991 and 1994 is simply the modern version of the research and investigation effort that was set up in the early 50s and has run ever since. Now, of course, there have been changes in, uh, of course, the personnel. Uh, there have been changes in the the way in which uh, these, these incidents have been investigated, but essentially it is the same project and the fundamental brief has not changed. That is, to look at the sightings, to satisfy ourselves that there is evidence of no threat to the defence of our country. By definition, the army is secretive and doesn't reveal information to the public. It prefers to keep silent rather than work openly with ufologists. But a few years ago, the Belgian army decided to cooperate with a group of Brussels ufologists. SOBEPS, the French acronym for the Belgian Society for the Study of Space Phenomena. In the fall of 1989, an airship appeared over Belgium. Witnesses described a large, black, triangular-shaped craft with three flashing red lights. In Brussels, Sobebs was quickly inundated with reports of sightings. The Belgian army agreed to cooperate with the ufologists and was ready to send up a reconnaissance aircraft. On March 30th, 1990, a triangle was detected on radar screens at Semerzak station. Just after midnight, Two F-16 fighter jets were sent up to pursue the object. One of the F-16s had the UFO on its radar screen, but the other aircraft was flying without radar. The unidentified object took off at speeds that no human could withstand. A few days later, Colonel Wilfred de Brewer, head of the Air Force, presented radar images to the press. They were quite astounding. The images showed that the spacecraft had accelerated at a speed of 30 to 40 Gs. At the same time, Colonel de Bruel rejected any possibility that the UFO could be some sort of secret prototype. The Belgian wave of sightings lasted until 1994. Now, 10 years later, they have yet to come up with a concrete explanation for all of the sightings reported. What's important to remember is not so much the sightings themselves, but rather the open dialogue that took place between a group of ufologists and the National Army. This joint effort was much more important than you may think. To carry out a thorough investigation, researchers need to know all of the data, and the best reports are often found in military files because they are written by experienced pilots and they are supported by physical evidence such as radar echoes. 
These files are rarely released to civilian researchers, the Army claiming that they must remain confidential for security reasons. Ideally, state agencies would be set up throughout the world, managed by an international body such as the UN. But the world is not ready for such an organization just yet. Towards the end of the 1970s, several meetings were held at the UN to discuss UFOs. Among those who attended were Professor Hynek, former advisor to the US Air Force, astronaut Gordon Cooper, and several other key figures. The meetings were presided by Kurt Waldheim, who was Secretary General at the time. The idea was to hold an international debate on UFOs. Unfortunately, the meetings were short-lived, since an American diplomat threatened to complain to the Senate that American funds to the UN were being used to study UFOs. Proof that before God, we are all equally wise and equally foolish. Discussions on the nature of UFOs remain extremely polarized between those who support the extraterrestrial theory and those who oppose it. This polarization is putting up a wall in debates and preventing the examination of further possibilities. In 1997, at the invitation of American billionaire Lawrence Rockefeller, well-known scientists gathered in Pocantico, New Jersey to discuss UFOs. It was the first time since 1969 when the Air Force dropped its investigation into the matter that a panel of scientists had gotten together to discuss UFOs. Led by astrophysicist Peter Sturrock, these discussions brought the strange sightings to the academic forefront. Mark Rodiger and John Schuschler were among the scientists invited to the meeting. The purpose of the meeting it was designed by Peter Sturrock to uh, do at least two things. Um, one was to be a, uh, a rebuttal, as it were, of the Condon Report. The Condon Report, of course, had come out in the late 1960s, and it had uh, said that UFOs were not worth studying scientifically. And Sturrock had been very critical of that, and he had always hoped that he could get a group of scientists together to look at the phenomenon objectively and reach a different conclusion, which he thought would be justified. So that was the first thing. The, the second was to present some of the latest UFO evidence to a, a panel of distinguished scientists to, to, see, to get their advice on the subject, to, uh, to see how they would react to UFO evidence that, that the scientific community normally doesn't ever view. The meeting was held in 1997 to allow the examination of physical evidence presented by people that do research in the UFO field uh, to be examined by people outside the UFO field. And in both cases, these people were scientists, scientists receiving the information, presenting it, and then the scientists examining it. And they were selected uh, based on people that could present the actual physical evidence, not stories, not wishful thinking, but evidence of things happening, uh, real photographs, real videos, real medical effects, m real ground trace effects, and that sort of thing. And there's, in this field, there's quite a bit of that. It uh, isn't often talked about and often discussed, and Dr. Sturrock thought it would be well to be able to expose this to an independent panel of people that had no interest or, or no knowledge of the subject and uh, get their opinion on what could be done or what should be done and how important it was. So that was the reason we met. There, there wasn't anything amazing in the reports from the panel. I think the evidence was solid, of course. I, I was there and presented some of it. I think it was evidence that the phenomenon is anomalous, but there wasn't anything so compelling that you know you would read the report and say, "Oh, why this is a, this is astounding evidence. Why you know th this really shows that that this UFO phenomenon is is, is unearthly, uh, or or alien, or can't be explained by science." Absolutely, you know, no, it was just good solid UFO evidence. The scientists gathered at Pocantico concluded that the UFO problem was not simple and was certainly not the result of a general or single phenomenon. The report added that each unexplained observation presented the scientific community with an opportunity to make new discoveries through the study of these phenomena. However, out in the field, the main difficulty in studying UFOs is learning how to pinpoint what's relevant. 
Over the years, UFO circles have become such a melting pot for all phenomena that it takes a lot of serious research to find any significant proof within UFO reports. Between 1991 and 1994, Nick Pope was tasked by the British government to assess the pile of UFO sightings recorded by their Ministry of Defense. He therefore had ample opportunity to appraise the quality of the statements made by witnesses. I think it's quite clear that uh, 90 or 95 percent of UFO sightings are either misidentifications of something quite ordinary, but perhaps seen in unusual viewing conditions, or by a witness who is not familiar with the particular object or phenomenon. But there are these hard core of cases, and there has been, uh, you know, right from the beginning, of our official investigations in this. And this is as true for the Americans with Project Blue Book as it is for the British. There are these sightings that we can't explain. Good quality sightings. I'm not talking about cases where we have insufficient data. I'm talking about the sorts of cases where we have, uh, say, police or military witnesses or pilots, say, who are, are seeing solid structured craft. I'm talking about the cases where things are tracked on radar. I'm talking about cases where uh, Air Force jets have been scrambled to try and uh, intercept these things and where perhaps we have good uh, photographic or video evidence uh, that has been properly analysed and enhanced. These sorts of cases. And when looking at these cases, I certainly, I am quite favourably disposed to the extraterrestrial hypothesis because when I've eliminated everything else that seems to be a very real possibility. Can I prove it? No, I can't. We do not have proof. But in my uh, mind, we do have good evidence. UFO sightings are an undeniable fact, proven by the thousands of statements and recordings that have been submitted. These sightings happen. Explaining them is another thing. Making a broad statement that they're all false or they're all true based on a single explanation seems rather simplistic to me. The truth of the matter remains to be seen. It's true that most cases are false alarms. In our work, we have proven that most cases are the result of an honest error made by the observer, while now and then we see cases where the error was made intentionally or designed as a hoax. In actual fact, what happens most of the time is that a person comes face to face with something that they do not understand. And they contact the police in the hopes of getting an answer to the mystery. Of all the sightings that are reported, practically none of them turns out to be a hoax. I would say maybe one hoax per thousand cases reported. But for all of the other cases reported, there is no reason why there needs to be one single explanation. The proof is the fact that we're discovering new things every day, like sprites in the upper atmosphere, which we discovered a few years ago. They might explain some of the strange lights seen by aircraft in the sky. So there's certainly a whole gamut of explanation. The extraterrestrial theory is simply a projection based on a desire to believe, and for good reason. If we take a look at aviation files and radar data, which seem to show objects displaying intelligent behavior, we're very tempted to believe just that. In actual fact, it's only one possible explanation. Unfortunately, ufologists usually have nothing more to go on than statements made by witnesses. How valuable are these statements, really? Rationalists tend to discard them under the pretext that a statement alone has no inherent value. We must exercise caution in considering these statements, but they are still a valuable source of information. If statements people make are truly of no value, then we might as well shut down the court system. Critics like to point out that when it comes to witnessing a UFO phenomenon, most people are not used to observing phenomena in the sky, even police officers and pilots. 
Il y a un argument qu'on oppose tout le temps à l'histoire des OVNIs, c'est effectivement le... Notamment... Arguments are always being raised against UFO stories, usually by rationalists. Because there's a difference between scientists who work as researchers and rationalists who adamantly oppose any stories of UFOs. Their argument is that astronomers don't see UFOs. If all these things were flying around in the sky, then scientists, especially astronomers, would see them. The problem is that astronomers spot UFOs the same way as everyone else. We know that for a fact. Peter Sturrock, an astrophysicist from Stanford University, did a study back in 1977 which showed just that. Another study showed that 5% of UFO observers were astronomers, so they do see things too. But what does an astronomer actually do? He doesn't look at the whole sky, just like scientists don't look at nature. They look at their instruments. A telescope has a very small field of vision. If an astronomer were to see a UFO, it would only appear in passing like a satellite, a meteorite or a bird. It would be very rare. They wouldn't have time to focus on the object. It would be gone before they knew it. When they see a meteorite fly by, they don't make anything of it. So astronomers do see strange things in the sky, but not usually while they're working. There's a genuine problem. When UFOs are discussed, some people say that they don't exist. The problem is not whether UFOs exist or not. The problem is that tons of arguments seem to be based on the idea that scientists observe nature, so they should be seeing UFOs. Scientists do not observe nature. They produce facts under laboratory conditions, very specific artificial conditions that do not correspond to the image of science portrayed in popular science magazines. Most UFO sightings have a perfectly rational explanation. They should not be considered of alien origin until all of the elements involved have been thoroughly analyzed. This analysis stage contains many hidden traps. Although they represent a very small percentage of objects reported, weather balloons can be mistaken for UFOs. Even seasoned observers like civil and military pilots have been fooled by these large silver spheres. Don Ledger, a Canadian civil pilot and co-author of Dark Object, took a keen interest in UFO sightings reported by his colleagues. He is familiar with the most common misinterpretations, like weather balloons, Venus, aircraft, auroras, meteorites, and billow clouds. Normally, uh, getting off track a bit here, usually large scientific balloons, and they are large. Some of these things are 300 feet across. They're filled with helium, and uh, uh, they're carrying scientific packages. We'll get a NOTAM as a pilot. You'll get a NOTAM with your, uh, with your boat every three months in the mail from Transport Canada, and it's NOTAM that this thing is going to be lifting off from a certain area, usually up north, where the air is more stable and where they're investigating anyway. And these things will go up. 80, 90,000 feet. And as they go up, you've seen, probably seen the older pictures of them. They look uh, long and skinny, almost like a baseball bat, and then they start looking like an ice cream or a parachute. But by the time they get to altitude, they balloon right out because the, the air pressure is less up there. So they turn into this big, oval, shiny thing because of the, the makeup of the material, you know, the Kevlar that, or not Kevlar, but the Mylar that makes these things up. And uh, can carry up to 4 million cubic feet of, uh, of helium in there. Right? And they can drift around up in the upper atmospheres for days and days and days, reflecting sunlight. And people will report them. And that's really, they have every right to, because it's quite anomalous looking up there, and it's sparkling away. Um, so they account for some UFO reports and so on. Yeah, no, po, ta. There aren't that many weather balloons. They're launched in northern Quebec. Winds are predominantly from the west, so don't try to tell me that these supposed weather balloons are traveling from north to south. Okay, now that I've made that perfectly clear, let's drop this whole weather balloon business. Skeptics better come up with a better explanation than that, because according to them, weather balloons are everywhere. All UFOs are weather balloons. Observers have more chance of seeing an aircraft, since planes are aluminum and may be painted white, so when the sun is low on the horizon, it can reflect off the cabin. The wings can't be seen, just a fine white line in the sky, so since the object is far away and can't be heard, it can be mistaken for a UFO. Venus is also a possibility. Most people in Quebec travel between Montreal and Quebec City. So they travel east-west on highways 10, 20 and 40, which means they may spot Venus setting in the west. If you see Venus setting in the north, call me. 
because it isn't Venus. Of all the planets, Venus is the one that is most often mistaken for a UFO. So what I'm saying is that people may be mistaking aircraft and planets for UFOs, that's true, but it's time they stop trying to tell us that people are seeing weather balloons. In the spring of 2002, a Montreal businessman filmed a curious sight in the sky. It was very early in the morning, and the object showed up clearly against the morning sky. Upon analysis, it was discovered that the object was nothing more than a mail plane arriving at the local airport. At times, the source of confusion is much more simple. Officer Nelson Jean with the Quebec Provincial Police recalls a UFO sighting recorded at his station. At the time, we were responsible for covering Montérégie, Montreal, Laval, the Laurentians, and Lenaudière. As I recall, it happened near saint julie People called to report colored lights in the sky. When our police officers arrived at the scene, they traced the lights back to a dance club. Someone was either accidentally or intentionally projecting laser beams into the sky, which was leading people in the area to think that they were seeing something from outer space, perhaps a UFO or a signal from extraterrestrials. Other than laser beam projectors, aircraft and weather balloons, we also need to consider objects entering Earth's atmosphere. Orbital debris, which is becoming more and more common. A few years ago, during a similar incident over France, the state police were inundated with calls throughout the country from citizens wishing to report a UFO sighting. At the time, Jean-Jacques Velasco was already heading up the French group CEPRA, which tracks objects entering Earth's atmosphere. It is an agency working for the French National Space Research Center, otherwise known as CNES. We've noticed that these days, a lot of sightings result from debris falling from objects in orbit. This was the case on November 5, 1990, when we witnessed an amazing display of debris from a Russian rocket. The debris was scattered throughout the skies over Europe, particularly over France. As you know, I'm quite familiar with the field of photography since I worked as an expert in this area when I was with CNES. I came to the conclusion that it is one of the most disappointing aspects of UFO cases. Why do I think that? Well, first of all, it's the element that evokes the most emotional response and most expectations from the public. We often hear people say, if only we had a good picture of this, we could check into it further. In actual fact, nothing is further from being solid proof than a single photo on its own. That was true even 15 or 20 years ago. Back then, I received funding to study all the tricks involved in photo analysis. We noticed that some people were very clever at faking photos. Nowadays, with computer technology, anyone can use commercial software to touch up photos. I've had a bet for 10 years that no one can produce a photo able to withstand photo analysis tests. There are two types of photographs of so-called UFOs. There are the cases where the witnesses are in a state of panic over something that they saw, and there is little information available. These pictures are typically a small white light against a dark background, or if taken during the day, the object appears as a small dot in the sky as was the case in Vrep, France, a few years ago, when an object was photographed against a clear blue sky. Even using the most powerful tools possible, the information extracted is minimal. Then there are the photos for which more information is provided. At the other extreme, you have fake photos. They don't pop up as often as you might think, but they still seem to be profitable in some countries. When I traveled in certain southern countries, I noticed that books were being sold with fake photos in them. 
generally they're pretty easy to spot. Then there's a majority of cases where an honest error is made. This happens when a person sees something that appears strange to them, and they take a picture of it only to discover later that it was simply the aurora borealis or some other uneventful occurrence. There are also cases where something odd happens in the camera when a picture is taken. Cases of optical phenomena or cases where something is on the film. I once saw a photo that had me stumped for the longest time until I analyzed the film under a microscope. As far as misinterpretations go with respect to photos or home movies, a lot of people mistake reflections for UFOs. Many people use small camcorders these days, which is great for us UFO researchers, since these films provide us with good visual material to analyze. I'll give you a quick trick for figuring out whether or not your photo or film has a reflection on it. You just need to draw an X across your photo. Take a ruler and draw a light line with a pencil from one corner up to the opposite corner. Then do the same with the other two corners. This will give you the center of your picture. If the brightest object in your photo is a reflection, then it will cross the center and keep on going an equal distance in the opposite direction. The reflection can't be anywhere else. The angle of reflection is equal to the angle of incidence. This is a basic law of physics. People often take pictures through a window or a glass pane, and cameras also have a protective lens covering, which can create reflections when a picture is being taken, like of a street light or of distant car lights. The photographer doesn't see the sources in his reduced field of vision. A car passes by, shines on the lens, and a small lens-shaped reflection appears on the photo. Before you call the press to say that you've just photographed a flying saucer, you should double-check to make sure that there are no reflections in your picture. Only then should you consider that perhaps there really was an object in the sky. If there was an object, then it's time for what I refer to as the investigative process, noting the color of the object and calculating distances and so forth to determine the size and possibly the weight of the object. At times, the so-called UFO is nothing more than an unidentified optical object. In the early 1990s, there were several sightings of discs with scalloped edges, vaguely reminiscent of the symbol used by the comic book hero, Batman. According to the reports, these bat-shaped discs first began to appear over Belgium before spreading to Spain and then the United States. Unfortunately for mystery lovers, there was nothing exciting behind these UFOs. The image was nothing more than a bright object, such as the moon or a streetlight, filmed out of focus due to the focus ring on camcorders that had just come out on the market at the time. Speaking of images, Earth is now constantly monitored by a network of satellites. Each day, these spies in the sky take dozens of pictures of the Earth. Why aren't there any satellite images of UFOs? Another mistake that ufologists often make with respect to satellite images is that they think if UFOs are flying around the Earth, we should see one appear on the satellite image now and then. When they say that, they obviously do not realize that remote sensing satellites circle Earth every 90 minutes at an altitude of 500 to 600 miles. If we look at satellite images, all we see is a bunch of tiny dots on a huge surface. Even if an army of 100 huge UFOs landed on Earth within the space of a few hours, it is highly unlikely that they would be detected by any of the dozens of satellites hovering over Earth. As we try to identify the unknown, some UFOs defy explanation. At least, it would seem so at first glance. However, just because we can't correctly label an object doesn't mean we should jump to the conclusion that we're being invaded by aliens. Remember the term UFO does not necessarily mean an interplanetary craft. Jean-Pierre Farabeau was a research engineer working at a physics lab within France's Polytechnical Institute. A few years ago, he wrote a book about unidentified flying weapons. One possible explanation for UFOs is that they are secret military aircraft. 
A historian from the CIA even wrote a report claiming that most unexplained UFOs could be attributed to flights by an aircraft referred to as the U-2. Well, it's true that some of the U-2's flight plans did coincide with UFO sightings. But in my opinion, this happened in a very small percentage of cases. There's also the fact that the U-2 was flown for the first time in 1955, whereas UFO sightings began to be reported regularly as of 1947. So the U-2 could certainly be used to explain some of the sightings, especially since it flies at a very high altitude. And it has what you might call a halo effect. Although it is shaped like a glider, glare from the sun's rays may cause it to look circular instead. The fact remains that it appeared in the sky too late to explain the first eight years of UFO sightings. And there's still the fact that only a few of the U-2's flights correspond to UFO sightings. There were other aircraft built after the U-2 that could have been mistaken for UFOs due to their speed and high-flying altitude. They were called Blackbirds. Two different aircraft were built that closely resembled each other, the CIA's A-12 and the Air Force's SR-71. But once again, the A-12 was flown for the first time in 1962, so it could not account for any sightings before that time. Naturally, it could account for some of the sightings reported since then. While engineers at the Lockheed Aviation Corporation were designing the U-2 spy plane, officials in charge of technical development within the U.S. Air Force were already conceiving of an even more ambitious project, named Project Silverbug. Their goal was to build a circular craft capable of vertical liftoff and able to fly at an altitude of 80,000 feet and a speed of Mach 3, or three times the speed of sound. Development of Project Silverbug was assigned to engineers at the Canadian firm Avro, which had designed the lightweight Arrow CF-105. The Avro car was um, an engineering study by the same company that produced the Arrow, the uh, infamous aircraft that uh, uh, was built by the Canadian government and then eventually cancelled. In fact, there is a popular movie about it uh, quite recently starring Dan Aykroyd. Uh, at the same time they were producing this jet aircraft, they were producing um, a circular vehicle that was said to be able to rise up on its own power and fly through the air. Uh, a number of other uh, uh, devices like this had been produced, but this was the Canadian government's own attempts Curiously, midway through the development, it too was cancelled. Unable to rise more than a couple of feet off the ground, the Avro car was a failure. Its instability made it dangerous to fly. In 1961, Project Silverbug was terminated, and one of the only two models built is now installed on a pedestal in front of the U.S. Army Transport School in Virginia. Could UFO tales have been inspired by test flights of the Avro car or other secret prototypes with an unusual aerodynamic shape, like the YB-49, or perhaps the V-173, nicknamed the Flying Pancake? Or in more recent years, perhaps UFO observers spotted the B-2 stealth bomber or the F-117A fighter, both of which have an unusual shape. According to rumors, recent UFO sightings could be flights of a secret prototype being built in the legendary Area 51, a triangular craft known by the code name Aurora. The rumors that the existence of Aurora have been Rumors that the Aurora exists have been spread by a magazine that is generally quite serious in nature, the Aviation Week in Space Technology. An article was published in 1990 in which they stated that there had been more than 40 sightings or telephone confirmations by sources within the military, proving the existence of this aircraft capable of flying at incredible speeds such as Mach 5 to Mach 8 at extraordinary altitudes, 
much higher than the blackbirds could fly. Extraordinaire, encore bien plus haut que les les blackbirds. On en a beaucoup parlé. I heard a lot about this aircraft around 1991, and for a year or two afterwards, we heard reports of what were referred to as skyquakes. They were like earthquakes, but they came from the sky. They came from the Pacific coast over California and headed in the direction of Area 51. They would occur every Thursday morning like clockwork. This was rather odd behavior for either a natural phenomenon or extraterrestrial beings. We're not sure why Thursday morning was so important to them. So it seemed to be pretty much of an established fact that it existed. And then we never heard anything more about it. The U.S. Department of Defense formally denied that it existed. We're under the impression that there are sightings of man-made crafts that we should normally be able to explain, but they must be secret military craft, and that's why we can't explain them. But even those don't explain all of the sightings. There are other phenomena which might help to explain several UFO reports but they are more difficult to zero in on. There is a whole field of natural phenomena which are mentioned now and then in scientific papers, but remain mysterious and unexplained. Such is the case for seismic lights or earthquake lights, as they are sometimes called, lights created by earthquakes. Franz Saint Laurent has taken an interest in this strange phenomenon. A few UFO reports, and I mean just a few, a very low percentage, can be explained by earthquake lights. But I mean real earthquake lights. As far as I'm concerned, to be earthquake lights, they have to occur during an earthquake or immediately before or after it. There also needs to be a link with tectonic strain. Before an earthquake occurs, there may be a period of months or years during which major forces are at work under the Earth's surface at particular locations. And as this stress builds, it can produce what I call tectonic lights, what others refer to as Earth lights. Well, actually, the interest in luminous phenomena, or UFO reports, began with uh, really an empirical approach. Uh, we were looking at the, uh, we meaning Ghislaine Lafreniere and I, were looking at uh, the relationship between unusual phenomena, balls of light, unusual animals, and uh, we tried to find out what could be related to them, and we found that earthquakes tend to occur in the same areas. So, as any science would, we pursued that and found out that, sure enough, luminous phenomena throughout the centuries have preceded increases in earthquake activity. Let me address UFO phenomena, which are the balls of light, the unusual colors of lights that inundate, or I should say inundate one's perceptual field, but they show uh, an oscillation. Uh, they often look like they're turning. And basically, different temperatures reflect different wavelengths and different colors. Those are physical phenomena generated by the Earth's itself. Strain within the Earth, stress within the Earth, uh, before earthquakes generate these balls of light. And we know that's correct because in any given area, there's an increase in luminous phenomena before earthquakes occur. The majority of luminous phenomena are tied to imminent earthquake activity, stress and strain within the Earth. And the reason we know that is that in areas where there's a buildup of water, for example, in reservoirs, uh, or when people pump water into an area, uh, for example, to bury uh, hazardous fluids, there's increases in earthquakes locally and also an increase in luminous phenomena. A very small number of luminous phenomena are associated with people having the experience of contact with an alien or contact with some other entity. We knew that in order to be seeing what we were seeing, there had to be a very strongly charged electric field producing these luminous displays in the sky. We knew that. 
Since the 1960s and 1970s, scientists have been trying to discover what causes these earth lights to appear in the sky. They made some discoveries and came up with a few theories. Some scientists researched the lights in a laboratory setting, but what they often found was that their theories only partially explained what was being observed. There were gaps in their theories, but that doesn't matter, that's just normal. After all, they were just starting to research the phenomenon. Well, one thing we do know is that tectonic strain, strain building up before an earthquake, is distributed along earthquake faults, very often along riverbeds or creek beds, on the top of hills, and a variety of unusual phenomena can be generated. Balls of light are simply one. Also, ultrasound can be generated, which very often rats or uh, dogs can hear. Sometimes odd smells are generated. Sometimes if you have a Peltier phenomena, you get a decrease in temperature locally, or sometimes an increase in spontaneous fires. If you happen to be unfortunate enough to walk through these fields, it's going to stimulate your brain directly. And very often, people experience a haunt. And in our research, we find that wherever you have luminous phenomena showing up, so-called UFO flap, you also have an increase of all kinds of other parapsychological phenomena. Haunts, poltergeist reports, basically strange things in general become more frequent, including mundane things like more light bulbs burned out, more alternators in your cars burned out, cars not st starting, uh, more anomalous behavior by humans, for example, more suicidal behaviors from uh, protracted depression. These things often occur in clusters. Even though research into Earth lights is still in its early stages, some scientists are beginning to find possible explanations. One of these scientists is Friedman Freund, professor of physics at San Jose State University in California. Purely by accident, I recently came across a scientist who works at uh, San Jose State University in California. He also works for the NASA Ames Research Center. He proposed a theory and created a model to explain how these lights were being produced. I found his theory interesting because it also explained why earthquake lights sometimes do not occur, since we have observed that they don't occur with every earthquake. What is interesting about his theory is that it is based on a discovery that he made several years ago. Below the Earth's surface, among igneous rocks, which form most of the Earth's crust, can be found something called charge carriers. I won't explain the chemistry behind it, since it's pretty complicated. So, he discovered these charge carriers, which he called positive hole pairs. When there is not much tectonic strain, these charge carriers lie dormant in the rock. On the other hand, when the tectonic strain builds to the point where an earthquake is about to occur, these charge carriers become quite mobile. In his laboratory, Frund calculated that these charge carriers could move as fast as 1,000 feet per second. That's pretty fast. So around the time of an earthquake, we have these charge carriers moving about, spreading throughout the Earth's crust. As these charges move, by definition, each one is a current. In electronics, we call it a whole current. It has a positive charge due to a lack of electrons. When these mobile charges hit the Earth's surface, they generate electromagnetic waves of various wavelengths. They then create a strong electric field at the Earth's surface. Frund calculated that in an ideal setting, for instance at the top of a mountain, the charge could get as high as one million volts per centimeter. That's a pretty powerful electric field. Once this electric field is created, it puts a strain on the air, which is normally an insulator. And the air changes from an insulator to a conductor and produces luminous displays in the sky. Mm -hmm. 
One of the conclusions that scientists arrived at during the Pocantico meetings in 1997 was that UFO sightings do not boil down to one single phenomenon. Research by Dr. Michael Persinger at Laurentian University in Sudbury shows that the assessment of these sightings goes beyond a mere, I believe in UFOs, or I don't believe in UFOs. One of the lessons we learn in science is that phenomena such as UFOs, luminous phenomena, that is an over-inclusive label. Let me give you an example. In the late 1800s, the word vapors was used to describe pneumonia, emphysema, tuberculosis, the common cold, and flu as well as cancer. They were all called the vapors because they influenced breathing. Now imagine what would have happened if penicillin was developed then and you gave it to people with vapors. Well, only those with pneumonia would have been beneficial and people would have dismissed penicillin because it did not treat vapors. The problem is the label. It's over-inclusive. The same thing with the UFO label. It over-includes a lot of strange phenomena most of them have very clear natural bases that we know about now, but there's still others we have to be open-minded about. And just because we're open-minded doesn't mean it's never measurable, which means we ultimately can measure it. In the perspective of, of science, anything is probable. And if we have a uh, phenomenon such as UFOs, or basically luminous phenomena, that's a more appropriate way to describe them, because UFOs is a pejorative label with all kinds of negative connotations. Odd, luminous events. Most of them we know from our data analysis, more than 80% are clearly tied to tectonic strain. We're talking about the real ones now, not the misperceptions. Well, the remaining 20%, it's hard to tell what the actual natural forces are. And the possibility that there are other phenomena yet to be discovered, including other intelligences, we still must be open-minded to that possibility. In general, the scientific community is not interested in UFOs. Why? Obviously, there is the ever-present funding problem. What self-respecting financial institution would put its credibility on the line by financing research into UFOs? No funding, no research. But there is a worse problem, prejudice. To most scientists, the logic is quite simple. If UFOs were real, then there would have to be extraterrestrial spaceships. And since interstellar travel is not possible, UFO reports cannot be true. In all research, observation must take precedence over theory. As Robert Layton, one of the pioneers of modern physics, once said, if something happens, it's because it's possible for it to happen. But of all the strange cases that defy explanation, how many are really prototypes of secret military aircraft, and how many are really due to natural phenomena as yet unknown? Could the other cases really be visitors from outer space? For now, it's impossible to say for sure. If there's one thing that holds true in the police world, it's that if you want to solve a problem, you must take an interest in it. We noticed that the science community turned its back on the Pocantico report. We weren't too surprised, since they've always had that attitude where this subject is concerned. I recently did an audit on the CNES Research Center, and along the way I met some prominent scientists from the technical field. I won't name any names, but I was stupefied by what some of them had to say. In their minds, the only things that truly exist in the field of science are things that can be created in a laboratory setting. If the great minds of science in all countries think like this, then we're not about to make much headway in the science of observation. The problem with UFOs is that we don't see them in abundance. We can say the same thing about scientific facts. Who has ever seen a scientific fact? If anyone ever has, I'd like to meet them. It's impossible. Scientific facts are charts, diagrams, and things you read about in magazines. You never hear anyone say, look, I just saw a scientific fact. If we take a cloud, for instance, sure it's a scientific fact, but only because it's been studied. Scientific facts do not appear out of thin air. Apples falling from trees were used to make jam long before they became associated with the law of gravity. Newton had to invent the law of gravity first. By the way, the Apple story never even happened. So we have a problem. 
To become a scientific fact, it must first be placed in the proper context. So the question is, what can we do with these UFO reports to capture the interest of scientists? We need to word the problem differently. Just because it's worded in terms of UFOs doesn't mean that the problem should be discarded completely with the claim that UFOs don't exist. That's simply not reasonable.